I think we keep all reptiles wrong. All of them, everyone, no matter how well you're doing bioactive, still wrong. <laughs> and the reason I think that is, let's say you set up a 20 gallon long for a kid that wants a, a leopard gecko, right? Let's say whatever, 40 breeder, nice huge cage for a leopard gecko. And you're gonna literally make this thing look like the side of the hillside in Iraq. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to get someone who doesn't have reptiles to understand why you should have, you should be able to keep a cobra. Right. Like, that doesn't make sense. That to them, it's like me saying you should be able to keep a fireball in a live hand grenade. Like, <laughs> yeah. it, it sounds stupid. You sound you don't sound sane or logical to them. What what are next? What's the next steps? Because you know, like you said, there's a few brands that all have a, a similar spike or similar uh, spectrum. Yeah. And if that is going to cause vitamin hyper uh, hypervitaminosis, what what are the next steps? I mean, realistically. I... <sighs> episode number 113 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin and thank you so much for tuning in today. Joining me on the podcast today is Ryan McVeigh of VivTech Products. I think most people are probably familiar with VivTech at this point. This was a brand started earlier this year by Ryan and his wife Erica. In the episode, we discuss what motivated Ryan and Erica to actually go forth and start a reptile brand, which is quite a feat. We discuss that corporate that we see in reptile products. Like one of the questions that I'm always stuck with is why do we see these big corporations producing such poor quality reptile equipment? For example, red light bulbs. We know red light bulbs are no good. They don't really serve a purpose and they may even be detrimental if they're interrupting photo periods and whatnot. So my question is why do we see large manufacturers or large companies building bad products or how are they getting away with generating bad products and selling them to customers? Because we know people are buying them. So Ryan has a really good insight in that formerly being at Zilla. So we talk about that. How are bad products getting to the market and how can we kind of move the reptile industry or herpetoculture in general away from supporting bad products. And of course, we discuss the VivTech products that are currently available on the market, particularly the UV LED bulbs. Now, if you are a regular listener of the podcast, you know that I had two main concerns with UV LED technology. The first was the amount of bulbs that are currently on the market from China, sort of no-name brands that actually contain levels of UVC, dangerous levels of UVC. Well, any level of UVC is dangerous. So a lot of these bulbs on the market right now that you'll find on Amazon or Alibaba are being promoted promoted as reptile bulbs, but they're actually don't have really any usable UVB and have a lot of UVC, which will be dangerous. So we discussed that and Ryan even shows us an example on his spectrometer of, of a bulb that does have dangerous levels of UVC. Now, my second concern with the UV LED technology is the lack of the UVA spectrum. Now, these bulbs do have some UVA, but it turns out that the there's an important section of UVA that is just not possible to produce right now with LED diodes. We're working towards it, but we're just not available yet. And that section of UVA is needed to stop D3 synthesis. So we know that UVB produces vitamin D3, but it turns out UVA is what allows us to actually pump the brakes on that system. Now that is an incredibly simplified version. If you're looking for something that has way more detail, go to the Reptile Lighting Facebook group. Dr. Francis Baines recently wrote an article that really breaks down the biology of how that happens, how the photoisomers in our skin actually interact with the different wavelengths of light and how that actually restricts the UV or the LE, no, the, sorry, the vitamin D three production. It's actually really fascinating and, and the science is there to support that. So that is a actual valid concern with these bulbs. Ryan is currently doing some testing and they're doing blood work as well. And he talks about how they're going to solve that problem. And of course, we're, they're trying to produce light bulbs that are more like the light that we get from the sun. So it, it's really a fascinating conversation and, and we kind of go back and forth there. And finally, we wrap up the conversation discussing the future of VivTech. What are some products that Ryan sees in the future of them producing? There's just some incredible incredible ideas he has. We talk about it all the time, how the aquarium hobby really has us beat when it comes to technology, especially when it comes to computer systems and automation. And it sounds like Ryan is headed in that direction, which is super exciting. So I hope you enjoy this episode. I know many of you have been wanting me to have Ryan on. I promise you it was ha has been in the works for quite a while and we were able to make it work today, which was great. 
If you are looking for more information on this episode, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you will find the show notes for every episode that has been produced. If you are interested in joining us on Patreon, head to patreon.com slash animalsathome. And as always, thank you so much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Let's jump into this chat with Ryan. Enjoy. Awesome. Cool. Well, Ryan, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you very much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. I'm very excited to chat with you. We've been chatting. We've been in contact since the summer, talking about doing another episode. And I know you've sort of you been launching this new brand, you and your wife, Erica, and you're busy all over the place. So I'm happy that we're able to uh, finally sit down and have this chat. Why don't we just start with VivTech to begin with? Tell me about VivTech in general. What motivated you to get going on this new brand? Well, so... Change, changes in my life and 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 stuff that happening in, in Zillow when I was there and things kind of got me thinking a little differently and I started to realize that uh, I had a lot different aspirations than what I was going to be able to do with Zillow um, and we me and Erica were thinking about it and we realized like there, there's something really interesting in the reptile community in the reptile community and products within the reptile hobby is if you look at fish like you have your goldfish tank. Or even your, or your betta bowl. Let's put those equal. You have some easy step into the hobby. And it's all set up and it's all easy and, and whatever. And then if you want to go bigger, you go a bigger tank and maybe you get some cichlids. They're a little harder, you know, or you get some other kind of fish that's a little more, little more technical. And then after that, like maybe you want to do saltwater. Well, now there's a whole nother world of level up where you can go from like, I have a bio cube, super basic, very easy, really nice entry level in saltwater. You can go all the way from that up to I could spend a hundred grand on a 500 gallon tank made out of diamond glass with Kessel lighting and you can go crazy with it. But in the reptile hobby, you don't, we don't have that. The same exact bulbs that are in your basic bearded dragon kit are what are on your lace monitor. Like Mm -hmm. it's the same thing. You have an animal that's a very basic care animal, maybe like a ball python or something. And the stuff that's used to take care of that is the same thing that we're using to keep Bolin's pythons. Like it's the same sticks and bulbs and dirt and products and things like that. So there really is no other levels, but there are levels of keepers. There are intermediate keepers, there are entry level keepers. There are people like me who MacGyver things together and make things work or build it themselves. And I think the hobby has become incredibly good at that, but there's a big gap in really technical, really effective higher end products that allow keepers to do more or, you know, have better efficiency, better controls, things that like, you know, Timmy and mom and their bearded dragon or their first leopard gecko or their family pet just really aren't going to need. But people like, like you look at the enclosures that I keep and the ones in the background that I'm watching in your house and stuff like that, the stuff that we do, keeping humidity is really on point, especially for some of these species could be major game changers to our ability to actually produce them and i think a lot of species that we keep and don't have luck with is because we're we're trying to use the wrong products we're trying to use stuff that exists but it's just not going to ever do what we need it to do and uh being at around a lot of the major companies and brands i realized that zilla zoomed exoterra those guys aren't going to ever do that not in a reasonable way that's accessible for us um they're going to try zoomed comes out with some really unique stuff once in a while because of the way their company works and how they go out into the market, it usually by the time it gets to the shelf for someone to buy is incredibly expensive for what it is and becomes kind of out of reach for people. Um, so between all of that, it was just, we realized there's a big niche for better products. There's a big niche for really some some intermediate to expert level knowledge in some products and that could bring some people's keeping to another level, uh, as well as some places that we realized that major industry is just not going to take us because the majority of their stuff is sold through pet stores, which just a lot of them don't have the ability to do that, to sell mm-hmm. to that level of a keeper. And most level times that level of keeper isn't going into a pet store. Yeah, it's really interesting drawing the parallels between the reptile hobby and the aquarium hobby, because just like you're saying, in the chain pet stores, you're going to find very basic aquarium items. There's nothing going to be very complex in there. But if you actually look at some of these fish keepers, the technology that some businesses, companies have is just mind blowing. You think they're doing these different wave controls and lighting yep. that's dimming and, and all these different things. And you think, and, you know, computer, th- it's amazing what they have. Like just go look into the fish world. You go, you'll mind will be blown and you wonder what 
is the stoppage on the reptile side? Like, why don't we have that? And is that is it mostly because it's driven by these big corporations, you think? It really is. It really is because I think it's driven by a lot of big companies that do it. Um, and I think a lot of the more technical things have been a little bit too... I'm not sure why nobody's really jumped in after them. I, I know people t- jump into something here or there. I think a lot of it is... I think a lot of it with the reptile hobby is we've all become so good at MacGyvering. We just kind of figure it out ourselves. There's some people who come up with some really unique things and they try to do something with it. But we also look at things like the, a lot of guys are hobbyists that start a business doing something and they go to reptile shows and it's kind of always stay as a hobby. They don't. And I see this in a lot of hobbyists and it's not a dash or a a bash them or a, a, a anything negative to them at all. But because when they're in the hobby and you treat it like a hobby, you there is a there's a wall you're gonna hit where you're never gonna be able to get further than that until you turn it into a business and look at it differently. And it doesn't mean you have to be like corporate and awful. It's more like you know when it's a hobby, you throw you throw your buddy a snake here or there, and you don't care, and you don't you know you trade stuff and whatever. And I see a lot of that with guys. And then when you do that, you you can't grow correctly. You're not looking at your your analytics. You're not looking at making sure that your products are selling and really what you need to make sure your products are doing well. And, and you're focused more on like your, your brand and your little company and your booth and people get stuck there. They get stuck just kind of being in the hobby. Um, and I think that's what, what, what ends up happening is they, they don't look at it in that range and it never gets there. Um, so that's something that actually, that's something that on, on the outside of this, when we started VivTech, we actually started five companies. Um, one of them is called <laughs> XG Consulting. So anybody who's stuck, with their business like that, where they are like, man, I have this cool idea and I'm stuck in the hobby. You can let me know. And extra G consulting is a way for us to help those companies find that way to take that unique product and get it out to more people. How do, how do I like how I can help anybody get those cool things out there? I don't want to be the only company doing something cool. I want to have 30 competitors that are all going after the big guys and all trying to you know, come up with something unique and different and build the hobby and make it better. Like that's, what's going to make this hobby grow and make it cool and really advance it. The major companies aren't going to do that much. Like they're just not, they're going to go for the stuff that has the margins that they need to keep going at box stores because that's where their money is. And that's fine. We need that. We need them to do that because we need them to get those entry level people. And we still use the stuff they use. Like we still use the, the terrariums and the screen cages and the domes and the supplements and foods and things like that. We still need them, but there are plenty of places where we could, we, we could really improve and, and, and um, do more, especially when we come to custom things and bioactive and all that stuff, the hot, the, the pet stores and the, the industry is going to be not, is going to be substantially behind the intermediate and expert hobbyist and where that is. Um, mm-hmm. And they're constantly going to be chasing after it, but they're never going to be able to produce. I don't think much that's really going to help those people. Um, they're, they're, they're going to be able to make some tweaks, but they're just, I think they're very stuck in the way that everything is. Well, I guess there's really no motivation for them to be tinkering with things you know, designing new products is expensive. Finding price points is expensive. And then trying to sell complicated products to people who are just getting into reptiles is almost futile. And yeah. it seems like in general, I think our economy over across the board, across all business, hopefully we start seeing a diminishing of these big, larger, powerful corporations and more, not quite mom and pop shops, maybe a little bit bigger than that, but more specialized companies that aren't as huge because it, it's, you know, I, I, my wife works for a giant corporation. It's like all the employees like hate it, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. they all hate the the boss. They all hate everything. And it just seems like it's not a great way to operate and, and they become out of touch with the customer. Exactly. And that was one thing I noticed a lot when, when, when I worked in that, in, in that industry is it's just most of the people now, not every company is like this, but most of the people that work at a lot of these companies, people don't look at it like, like they see zoom at Exoterra Zilla and they see like with Zilla me at the booth talking about reptiles. I'm a keeper Zilla, uh, uh, zoom Ed, you know, a lot of those guys, the sales guys, those are all, hobby nerds and it was started by a hobby nerd a lot of those guys are nerds um uh exoterra like the guys over in germany are all big nerds and there's a, and the, their sales guys in the us a lot of them are reptile keepers but but the when you get to the corporate offices most of the time none of those people even have pets like they're not pet people they're they're corporate they're they're business people they don't look at the, the products and how the animals go together and how the tank goes together and what components they need in order to survive. They look at the margins that each one gets and they 
kill things based on how much money it makes, not whether it's needed for a kit um, or whether it's good for an animal. Now, granted, there are people at these, obviously, that are making sure the, the, the stuff is safe. Um, they should be making sure the stuff is safe. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't see them ever getting out. They're not they're, Yeah. They're not going to be able to grow. Like they're not going to be able to get out and, 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 and do that. I don't think, cause they also kind of take away that entrepreneurial passion in a way, mm-hmm. like it becomes a machine that just runs and it's not exciting. And there's, there's, there's less push to it and there's less humanity to it, I think too. Um, and then, and that's kind of one thing too, with VivTech that we wanted to do too, is I wanted to bring that back to it. And I think with what I was doing was when I was at Zilla, there, there's ways to promote, you know, better husbandry and to, um, you know, create better products and to put better information out there and continue to, to, to have happy employees and promote conservation and sponsor amazing things with animals and do all of this positivity, this positive things on cost money. But you get that back. Like some of the biggest companies that I see exploding out, out of nowhere are like Bombas and Tom's. That is a company that makes socks and one that makes shoes. And you pay $20 for a pair of socks because they give away a pair of socks. So you yeah. essentially buy two and people are okay with that because they want to do something better. They want to give back. But giving back is kind of hard sometimes. You don't know how to do it or how to get involved. But if I can buy a thing that's high quality that I like, and then you're going to do like you're going to give back on top of it. So I get that positive, that positive feeling by buying a thing that I need. Like that's easy. And that made those companies grow really, really, really fast. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's so much going on that I think that these big corporations just get so focused into how things were and how things are and fighting for the shelf like they have for years. And they're very, very slow to react. And, and that, is one of the reasons that it makes it very difficult for us as keepers is they're slow to react. That's a big reason the U.S. is ten years behind Europe. Mm-hmm. Well, and and for people that maybe not realize how big a company like Zilla is, not Zilla itself, but the the you know parent corporations. People we just see Zilla, we think okay, that's just one of the reptile brands. But maybe you could run through, for example, yeah. just the corporate structure of how how big that ladder is. <laughs> so just as so so this is what's interesting too. Every single reptile brand that you know is run totally differently. Zoomed is a private company owned by Gary Bagnell. Like that is a private company owned by him. It's totally, there's no stock. It's those guys, they're alone. They do their own thing. Um, Hagen is a giant corporation that's privately owned. So they own like, you know, Fluval and aquatic brands. They own dog treats and tons of different brands in the pet industry. Um, and then Central owns, uh, Central Garden and Pet is the, com- the corporation that owns uh, Zilla. Uh, brand and in the branch that I was in up in Franklin, it's Zilla, Coralife, Aquion, Kent, and KT. So KT Small Animal, and then all the aquatics brands. Um, and that they also own Nylabone, Four Paws, uh, Wee Wee Pads, and stuff like that. Um, a whole bunch of other brands. Uh, I don't think I could name them all if I tried. Um, Pennington Seed, they own a bunch of seed and stuff that's at Home Depot too. Uh, but yeah, Central Garden and Pet is like a $2.5 billion corporation. They're gigantic. Yeah. And traded um, on the New York Stock Exchange, like a massive yeah. company. Yeah. Yeah. They're a very, very, very big company. So um, they 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 like to buy, buy up smaller companies and, and hold on to those smaller companies and let them just keep doing what they're doing and like assist them to grow and do more. Um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And a lot of times I see it really has a lot to do with how I, I think how much they get involved in those companies sometimes. Cause it was interesting to watch like random dog bed company or something like that, or not dog bed company, but just some company they picked up, you know, um, watch how they tweak, how they got them involved, like integrated into the, into the company as a whole. And, you know, there's some things that tweak and, and then just watch how these companies either flourish or don't. And sometimes they do great. And sometimes they don't like, uh, Kent Marine is a, a, a Jack Kent created Kent Marines, a bunch of chemical products for like salt water and very, very well researched, incredibly knowledgeable guy. Like this was, this is the stuff you use for high end aquarium and uh, central bought it, but he was selling, he was selling direct to a lot of people. And because central did more distribution, didn't really do that. They took that away, which caused that company to change drastically because of the way it was individually getting to all these individual independents. Um, and then depending on which wholesalers bought those products from Central or not would depend on whether those independents could get them anymore. 
So it caused Kent to slow, to go, it, to, its sales to go way down um, and eventually dwindle to basically nothing till they like dissolved the brand and moved it into other things. So like that stuff happens and they, and they make adjustments, but um, yeah, it's, it's, but a lot of times they end up taking on these companies that do really great. So, wow, oh, it's interesting. Yeah, no, it, it is definitely interesting when you look at the whole corporate basket. You don't, people may not realize how big that chain goes. And, and that was one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, especially because you were at Zilla and we, you've kind of already answered how, you know, basically bad products stay in those lines because there's no motivation to innovate and people are buying them anyway. But w- w- when you were there at Zilla, how did that make you feel, for example? Like how much, you know, like selling red light bulbs or blue light bulbs, for example, which I'm <laughs> sure you were like, oh, I hate these things, but they're being yeah. sold under your brand. And how much control did you have there? First thing I told my my boss when I walked in was I'm killing cage carpet. It's garbage. I hate it. <laughs> yeah. And he yeah. and he said that's what you think until you look at the numbers and then we're then tell me what you think. Um, and that was a reality. They sell so much cage carpet. It I couldn't kill it. Not that I didn't want to. I just couldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing too was I kind of got into a spot where I'm like, okay, I'm gonna kill something. I know why cage carpet <laughs> exists. I hate it. Yeah. I know yeah. why it exists though, and the, it does have. It has some value when used properly. So how can I tweak it to make it where it would be something better, but still have that same ease? And I went down that path for a while, but didn't find anything really crazy innovative that would make a big difference. So we just kind of left it how it was. Um, But no, there was a ton of stuff that I wanted to kill, but I couldn't just because the sales were so high. And the reality too is to an extent of like like red bulbs. Um, Red bulbs are a weird one for me because they're not bad. They're just not any, they're not the best. Like for a long time, we all believe that reptiles couldn't see red light. Well, they can, but the red light bulb in my bedroom, like if I had it in a tank in the room, it's not going to disrupt my sleep. It's just not the best. I'd rather have it not be light like that. So that's kind of where you end up with them. So they're not the best, but they exist. And it got to a point where, unfortunately, to be, to be honest too, you kind of get to a point when you're there where you're fighting against like my knowledge and husbandry and, and biology and all the background I have on, on these animals versus the sales that these products are making at, at these major stores and the, the, how much they're moving. And like, as a company, you have to make money. Like as much as yeah. people want to say like, oh, it's all greed. Well, realistically, yeah, there's margin in everything I sell. I make money on everything I sell. Cause if I don't, then I don't have a business. Like, mm-hmm. Well, and you have to please shareholders too, if you're a big corporation like that, yeah, you don't exactly. just get to say, Hey, no sales this year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like you have to do stuff. And, and I found people that were there that were big animal people that had, had told me like, you kind of get to a point where you may not launch exactly what you want. It may not be the best thing you think you can make, but it's not going to hurt the animals and it's not bad. Mm-hmm. And that's, kind of where they ended up, where, where they ended up in order to do that. And I just, that was kind of where I was like, yeah, like I get that, but I'm just not cool with it. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. Like, I, I think that we should constantly be innovating to do better. Every single thing I launched while I was at Zilla was some sort, there was something improved on it from whatever else existed. Like it was different or at least had something better about it that solved some problem. I refused to put out just another thing that was the same as everybody else. So that was something that I did with every single one. And most of the time I could do that without it costing us any more money or any more money to the person. It wasn't going to be a more expensive thing. It was just rethinking how it was designed and tweaking it. Like the rock layers from Zilla are a good example, the humid hide. I put the entrance on the side and it ramped it up into it. So, because if you take a humid hide and you put a hole at the top, it's a chimney for the humidity. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you let <laughs> yeah. all the humidity up the top? So yeah. I am an engineer and my engineering backgrounds in HVAC and, and humidity and airflow and temperature and thermodynamics. And so like, this makes sense to me. So I created a little tiny convection and made it where they could go in where they, it gives them enough airflow that it doesn't stagnate, but it holds the humidity. So like, that's an awesome humid hide but it's still to anybody looks just like a resin rock. They don't know why it works the way it does. I do, but it's a better product for them because of that. And that Mm -hmm. was, that was everything I was trying to do was that kind of stuff. And a lot of times it just, I didn't have the opportunity to do it exactly what I wanted. Well, so now you must feel like you have a, 
I mean, obviously not being part of a huge corporation, there's less funds to work with, but the freedom of coming up with ideas must feel like kind of a weight off your shoulders in a way. Yeah, it took me a, it took me a couple months, to be honest, to like get out of that corporate mindset and like just get out of the tension. Honestly, uh, about two weeks before I left for Pomona, I, I drove out to L.A. from Chicago. Um, before I did that, like two weeks before that, Erica caught me pacing in the living room. I was just walking back. For, I was frustrated because I'm like, I know I have an email to send or a call to make or a deadline or something. And I'm not thinking about it. And I'm like, I've sat down four times to write out my to do list. And I can't think of what this nothing I'm writing down is this stressful thing. Mm-hmm. And I can't think of it. And I was just pacing around the living room. So she's like, you get, come lay in the bed, lay down on my lap. I'm going to rub your head and you just relax for a brief minute. And I'm like, OK, fine. So I did. And like after I kind of like relaxed for a second, I, I realized I didn't actually have anything to do. I just didn't know what to do with not having anything to do. Mm-hmm. So I just had that tension and anxiety. And like it took me. It took me a while for that to go away before I finally like was calmer and excuse me, more relaxed. And, but that, as soon as that happened, like then that passion came back tenfold. It, it came mm-hmm. back as soon as I started doing this, but that anxiety was still there. That, that like yeah. over looming deadline. And there's something there. That monkey on my back was still there. Um, that trip out to LA actually did it. That, that man, I, I drove to Denver. And if you drive from Chicago to Denver, Colorado, it's a plate. It is flat. There's nothing. It's awful. It's the most boring, <laughs> horrible drive ever. But once I got to Denver, I stayed at my aunt and uncle's house, um, which is cool. I got to see some family. So that was like nice. The next day I left and you drive Denver's right at the base of the mountains and you go right into the Rockies. And for the entire next day, I drove through the Rocky Mountains all the way out into Utah. Um, and like the scenery is unreal unreal anybody anywhere in the world like that you should just just fly to denver rent a car drive to vegas fly home like Mm -hmm. it's worth it it's it's incredible i spent the entire time just driving like this (laughs) watching and uh and it was just so big and and like breathtaking like it just i got out the other side and was just really really relaxed and kind of inspired and happy and like had just had an amazing day an amazing drive and it just melted all that off my back um and the next two weeks of driving to la and going to texas for the show and looping around the country and herping all night and sleeping in my van camper i built like like it it was incredible and it and it and it really just kind of got me back home just fired up (laughs) but one thing you did say that did does suck is i don't have that corporate bank account to go do all the cool things i want now yeah, there's no um, black Amex card. <laughs> exactly. And that was one thing that that's one thing that actually I got asked when we started Viftech. So I want to clarify this. No one except for me and Erica has anything to do with Viftech. I got asked how I got Zilla to sponsor me into building a new brand, which I thought was really funny that anyone thought that corporations give people money to start competing brands. But <laughs> yeah. but but no, this was uh this was me and Erica clearing out our 401ks and our savings and putting it all together. Like we even had offers for people to invest big names, even in the industry that wanted to get involved in what I was doing. And we told them no, um, just because I have a very specific view for what I want. And I know a lot of it's not going to be a lot of the people that I've been working with in the industry for the past decade are not going to be as appreciative of it. Cause I think that there needs to be some major changes. And I think we all need to take a look in the mirror for once and mm-hmm. really start accepting what we're doing and how we're doing it and how we can do better. And, uh, and I'm going to be pretty vocal about it. So <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be everybody's best friend for a while, but, and that's why we wanted to do it ourselves. Now I think a lot of people are going to be behind it and I think it's going to be something that the hobby needs. And I think I've seen so much of just people getting more excited about husbandry and natural, mm-hmm. natural history and really understanding their animals, not just having as many as they can. And that's been it's just kind of been this perfect storm storm of time to bring that out. But that's why we didn't why we didn't do any other investors or anybody else. I didn't want anybody telling me or Erica that we couldn't be that, that we couldn't step in when we needed to, that I didn't want to have fear of anybody else controlling our our message. Yeah, it probably makes more sense to establish your voice, how the message you're going to give, and then maybe if investors come on years later. And that 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 experience you're talking about of having the 
infinite to-do list, to-do list where you can't find the thing that, oh yeah. my God, that is such a relatable thing for me. Yeah. It still happens to me sometimes. Sometimes I'll just blow like half a day thinking about the thing that I must have to do and then it's just not there and you go, Man, yeah. okay, that's it's, anxiety. <laughs> it sucks. It's so bad. It's just, it's the worst feeling because it's, it's that, it's like for losing your kid in the mall. Like, <laughs> yeah. and then realizing two hours later that you didn't bring your kids. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Like, it's just an anxiety, a panic attack the whole time. And you're just like tense and freaking out. And then it's for nothing. Yeah. yeah. And that, luckily I haven't had one of those. I haven't, I haven't been pacing in the house since uh, August. So I'm doing pretty yeah, good. good. But, but yeah, no, it's, it's still, it's still a lot. Like there's still a lot of pressure. There's still a lot of stuff, but it's, it's definitely different. Like I make my own schedule. I get to hang out with my kids every day, which I did through COVID anyway, but it wasn't the same. Cause I, was sitting in a computer miserable. Like yeah, now yeah. I can play with them and hang out when they get home. I just leave my desk and go do hang out with them, help them with their homework, cook dinner. When they go to bed, I can go back out and work again. Like it's just been so much nicer. You know, I it's yeah, it's been nicer. It's still a ton of work. I still have more to do than I can ever do in a 24 hour day. Um, but yeah, man. what's that saying? It's like entrepreneurs are the only people that choose to work 80 hours a week to get away from a 40 hour a week work week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So let's, let's talk. A little, oh yeah, go ahead. I was say, but that 80 hours is like, it's just spread out in a way where it, it feels like it's 10. It feels well, like I enjoy doing, it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Let's go back to that sort of Tom's model or yeah, Tom's model, because we, you had mentioned that. And I know that you actually have incorporated that or folded that into VivTech. So maybe you could talk about how you guys are incorporating the, sort of a more holistic, I'm not sure what the word is, philanthropic <laughs> yeah. uh, vision. Well, and the, the, the one thing that killed me when I started it at, at Zilla was that they weren't, they weren't donating to us arc. They, and they weren't doing a lot of outreach like that, but that was just at the time they didn't really have that inroad or that knowledge. So, so we started doing that right away. Um, and it was just interesting to me when I work with us arc and Phil, how many, how many people in this industry make incredible amounts of money off the industry, but don't help to support it at all. Mm -hmm. Like they just leech off of it. And I hate that. I hate that. Like if you're, I don't understand the mentality of this is your life. This is your, this is your livelihood. This is what you do. And you're not putting aside some of that money to protect it. That just, that mentality doesn't make sense to me. So right away off the top, um, uh, out of the net profit, and this is the net profit. So this is definitely, this is what would come back. This is what would come back to me and Erica and go into the company. Um, this is just, yeah. So out of that, 10% of that is getting cut between 5% is getting donated uh, to US Arc and US Arc Florida um, to help continue to fight for our rights to keep these animals. Because if we stop being able to keep these animals, there's no reason for me to make light bulbs or anything else. Like it really <laughs> yeah, kind of doesn't, simple you know, as that. like that's, it's easy, you know? And when it comes to US Arc Florida, for anybody in the U.S. or anywhere who is like, oh, it's Florida. It doesn't matter. It's not me. The reason U.S. Arc Florida matters so, so freaking much. Two of the biggest reptile uh, uh, distributors for the major pet stores and all of the pet stores in the country, two of the biggest ones are in Florida. Mm -hmm. So if Florida loses their ability to keep a ton of stuff, so does most of the whole rest of the country lose their supply. Or the fact that like some it's more than 90% of tagus come out of Florida. Now they can't be bred in Florida. Guess what's going to get really scarce really fast? Yeah, exactly. Tagus. You know, iguanas, same thing. Now we all talk about green iguanas and whatever, but like how far until they throw all iguana species and iguana delicatismas on there. Now you can't have that. Now you mm -hmm. can't breed that. And there's two people outside of Florida. I know that have those. Yeah. 20 people in Florida with them. So like, there's massive, massive problems if we lose Florida. Florida is an enormous, enormous bed of where our animals are produced and brought in. Florida and California and New York are three, three of the biggest states we need to fight for because Florida, all three of them are major import spots. That's why, that's why the animal rights groups go after them. That's why that ban for shipping in uh, uh, New York was going to happen is because of LaGuardia. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't ship anything out of LaGuardia, no animals come in from Europe anymore. Right. Like it's that's a, a really, and we were all just looking at it like, oh, it's just shipping in state. It doesn't matter. It's not that. That's not why they're doing it. Like, and we have to pay attention. So that's why we wanted to make sure USR Florida is involved. And 
people need to care about us Art florida too i know it's a lot to fight for i know it's a lot to put money at i know it feels like we're gonna fight forever but guess what the people who are fighting us make money fighting us so they're not gonna stop so we yeah. are gonna fight forever so yeah just accept it put it in your pocket like that's why we built that into VivTech. i know i'm gonna fight this for the rest of my life so instead of like arguing about it or being upset or trying to think about how I'm going to donate something here or there. We just built it into our pricing of every single thing we sell. Every mm -hmm. single product that is made by VivTech and ever gets sold for the entirety of this company, 10% of the profit will be donated. And the other 5% goes to conservation initiatives. And, and I think as far as the conservation goes, I think there are just different selections that the purchaser can choose or how does that work? Yeah. So I thought that would be kind of cool. Like, like if you have, if you're a frog person and you buy the, the first call bulb, and then you get there, it, it's a pop-up at the checkout that asks you where you want your percentage to be donated to. If you're a frog person, you could go to Project Mitsinju in uh, Madagascar that does uh, mantella research and, and, and conservation. If you're an iguana person, there's the International Iguana Foundation, Turtle Survival Alliance, TTPG. Um, there's, a, 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 there's a ton of different organizations on there. Crockfest is on there. So I'm excited to go down at Crockfest in, this winter and hand them a check from VivTech just from you guys buying bulbs and, you know, mm -hmm. clicking donate to Crockfest. So Crocodile Conservation is going to get some help just because people bought their bulbs. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And I think, and it's the same model I use with this podcast as well. I donate to conservation as well. And I, I want to see more people doing it because you can make a tiny percentage and you don't, as the, the person running the business, you don't notice it really. And yeah. the money just gets funneled that way. And I think it's a really important message for us to be giving to other reptile keepers. And one, I think, frustration that some people have with US ARC. Now, I'm somewhat disconnected from it because being in Canada. Yeah. And I just want to know what your opinion is on this is they fight for our rights, which is great but they also don't really talk about welfare and how to make sure we're caring for our animals properly. So sometimes people say, well, they're just fighting for the sake of fighting, but also maybe we should also analyze like what, you know, how we're keeping some of these animals. Right. And so, so what, do you, what do you think of that? Yeah. U.S. Ark is one dude. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's, That's the answer. It's one guy. If everybody wants U.S. Ark to be more, and I totally agree. I totally agree that we should have a standards. I talked to a bunch of people we've talked and I've talked with Ashley Desan and other people about in, in Canada and the US about trying to create a standards organization or something like that, mm -hmm. because of, I have time, but, but, <laughs> but like it needs to happen, but US art can't do it. They don't, it's one guy and they don't have the funding or the time. The other thing too, is I don't think people realize how US art works. So US art is a board of industry people, which now I've also heard that like, I've heard people argue like US ARC doesn't have any herpetologists on their board. So we don't care about them and they don't care about conservation. And I need to clarify this. There is an enormous amount of things in the reptile hobby that need to be addressed. Conservation mm -hmm. is one of them. Conservation of the concert, wildlife conservation, conservation of the animals in, in the industry, in the hobby, um, conservation of, 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 of our abilities and our rights, things. Oh, there's, con there's a lot more of conservation than just wildlife conservation. Um, and then on top of it, there's, you have, so you have the conservation side, then you have the laws side, then you have the welfare side, then you have, there's nobody that does all of it for any group of anything like this lobby, like the HSUS are who we fight with does kind of, well, they kind of do all of it, right? Like they lobby and they also put out a lot of things on, you know, animal welfare and, you know, legislation, things like that. So if we wanted to be that, we could totally do that. U.S. Arc's budget on a really good year is half a million dollars. HSUS's budget on a really good year is $250 million. Yeah. So as soon as we get U.S. Arc 500 times bigger, we will have the most amazing care guides and standards and everything. But if everybody continues to argue about whether U.S. Arc is doing anything or not, and if they're doing good enough and whether we should support them, they're never going to be any bigger and they're never going to be any better. And there's no one else that's going to come out other than the people that are on the board like that. People like us that are going to do this. There's not like there's the people who can really do something generally don't have enough time to build a whole nother organization. We need to really support people who would do it. Um, but we need to understand that it costs money, a lot of money. And we need to constantly be funding U.S. ARC as much as we can until that can be a possibility where that grows. Another organization will at some point come up to be that. Or U.S. Arc will be able to grow to be that, but right now you're asking, you're asking a lemonade, a kid at a lemonade stand to be McDonald's. Like, right. 
they can't. And it's not. That's a really important point to make. And I've never really thought about it before. And I wonder why that message isn't more prominent when that, that, uh, you know, when people raise that point about U.S. Arc, I, I guess people know about it, but I never really realized that it was a single person and how small it actually is. Yeah, it's it, it really is. I mean, it granted, it's a single it's it's Phil Goss, the president who's basically does everything. Um, he has some people that will help with like social media stuff. Um, and then he's got lobbyists that they pay attorneys and things like that. So it's not right. the only person involved isn't him, but the only U.S. Arc yes. person is him. You know, so like that's that's really a that it really is a thing. It really is one dude saving our all of the entire country's ass. Like, mm-hmm. I'll just make it real clear. It's one guy, and every time you see him, if you don't shake his hand and thank him for everything he's done, like you are missing out on probably one of the key people who is the reason that the show you're at exists. Period. Mm-hmm. It's that guy. And all of us is a community that support him and that organization. So it's just going to be, it's going to be important to keep supporting it. And people can, everybody wants to find a reason why it's not perfect so that they don't, Oh, I'm not going to donate because they don't have a herpetologist on their board. Well, what would that do? Like that has nothing to do with lobbying in the industry in Washington. And on top of it, yes, they do have, they have, they don't have people on the board, but they have a lot of people who are, um, uh, they use as a, uh, consultants like there's a lot of consultants um a lot of herpetologists a lot of biologists a lot of people from the industry i mean it's not just because the board is not does not have one of everybody it doesn't make sense for the board to have one of everybody the board that they have is very sensical and driven to stopping legislation understanding the industry as it is and that's and realistically as well as much as people don't want to hear it like us arc here this is something i said recently us arc recently changed their logo to a more clean logo, which caused a huge stir because everybody think it looks thinks it looks like the U.S. bank logo. And it's very similar, just like a lot of other U.S. anythings in the U.S. And everyone's like, oh, why would we want it to not look like creative in U.S. and, you know, have the snake and be our own and make it look like U.S. bank? And I'm like, yeah, when we're writing a letter to a legislator or a government official, why would we want them to think of money? <laughs> yeah, we should make exactly. them think of philanthropy and giving out things and and, and, and love and happiness because any politician anywhere cares more about you keeping your lizard than getting money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah there's, so, it, it, it's an image. We want to portray the right image when we're and it's, you know, it's sitting clean, at the table. It's clean. It's readable. It's it, they can understand it right away. The old logo was a little more graffiti style. I'll be honest. I hated it too. I looked at it when I showed up at Tinley and I looked at Phil and said, dude, what did you do? because <laughs> i was like the old logo was cool but we talked for a while and he's like you know how many actually representatives ask what that says because they can barely read it because it's stylized or yeah. like what what ozark is ozark like yeah ozark <laughs> but like so this really breaks it up makes it us arc makes it clean and they're still going to keep the old logo around but like but that's what what we gotta we gotta think about and either way like what my point with that was we're talking to people who care about different things than we do, who are trying to stop us from keeping the things we like. We're, we yeah. can't, you can't talk to them like they're animal people. And you don't need animal people to talk to them because animal people won't get through to them. You have to talk to them in a very, very different mentality and not just animal welfare. There's a lot to it. It's not all money either, but you have to understand politicians and politics to, to understand how to work with them. And if you think that bringing in a biologist to say, or a herpetologist to say that like, hey, those animals are endangered or whatever. They don't care. Look at what they put on the, the ESA. The Endangered Species Act is getting there. What are they looking at putting on it? I, was, I laughed because they're looking at there's something that actually we're going to have to look at in the in the U.S. because you know, U.S. Art just put it out. They're looking at putting some reptiles on the Endangered Species Act. Again, one of them is a native U.S. species and the other one doesn't come from the United States at all. So putting it on the Endangered Species Act does nothing except <laughs> stop the breeding and working with that animal. But right again, yeah. So anyway, I don't know. It's just U.S. Arc does. An, they are David fighting Goliath with a toothpick and winning a lot, like a <laughs> yeah. lot, lot, which is impressive. And that's what we need to be looking at is the fact that we're paying an organization to fight for our rights. And they sued the government and won, even though the government had on its side over half a billion dollars in companies pushing back on us. We won. Like, 
Well, it's a really good, it's a, it's an, yeah, it is insane. And it's an amazing perspective to add to it. And, and many of the listeners know, I just moved out of a city that is essentially on the verge of, you know, banning like every reptile. Like they, they sort of came up with a positive list and it's just a, it's a laughable list. If you're an animal or reptile person, you look at it and you go, a, I've heard of half these species. B, all of these would have to be wild caught. It's like very strange. And, but like you said, it doesn't take me going in there to talk about animals to to sway them. You have to sort of counteract the animal rights groups that approach them with that rule because you can tell that it was just an animal rights plug, plug, like plugged into the government. The government just put this out and, and now they have to deal with the aftermath. But yeah, we need people fighting. And, yeah. and like you said, it's a, it is a David versus Goliath situation for sure. And it's, and you got to realize too, like those people who are making those laws, like, like you said, an animal rights person showed up, handed them this and said, Hey, you should look at this. It's going to stop somebody from putting a tiger in their bathroom, which <laughs> yeah. everybody that's even animal, even if you're an exotic animal keeper with a tiger, like that's still insane. And we all yeah. want to stop that. That's improper care. We don't want those people to have those things. We want to stop people who shouldn't have animals like that from getting them. Everyone does, but there's a line on where you want to put that. And the other thing, and, and, and th- when animal rights groups bring something to them, like, Hey, this is going to stop. This happened in Madison. There was a dude with a baboon in a, in a bathroom in his basement. <laughs> if that was its enclosure. It was the bathroom. And he had kids. Any logical person wants to stop that. So they don't have to know anything about animals to go, yeah, no, somebody with a kid shouldn't have a baboon in their bathroom. Like, that's <laughs> insane, right? So that's what they lead in with. And, the, and, and any reasonable person would completely agree with that. But what they don't understand is they're not they're not animal people. They don't understand what the rest of that means. And the same thing, like if I I don't know NASCAR, if somebody came to me and said, did you know that NASCAR is directly related to baby deaths in the United States? And they handed me something that said that and proved and like a study that proved it. Like, I don't know, crap. Who am I? I don't who am I to say that's not true? Like, that's pretty convincing evidence. And I don't know anything about it. So, yeah, I guess we should stop NASCAR because they're killing babies. Totally dramatic. NASCAR doesn't kill babies. Yeah, yeah. as as far as we know. I'm just saying, like, something like that, right? You're going to obviously go, oh, my God. and But you don't know about it. And we have to understand that those people don't know animals like we do. They don't understand it. So they're being taken advantage of by an organization that knows that. And we need to go in and go, no, 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 no. Here's what an animal is like. Here's how they interact with kids. They have these in classrooms. Here's studies that show how um, kids in, uh, interacting with exotic pets are more likely to go into STEM STEM uh, uh, position uh, careers in their life. And just all these things like that, that we can show that, oh, okay, it's not the baboon in the bathroom. No, take all these things off, make a permit list for these things. Cause these things, people, there are people out there who should keep, but not everybody should have them. And then if you want to ban stuff, like you want to ban tigers in the city limits, like that's not unreasonable. Like, I don't think people should be able to, like, I can't argue that. There's some stuff I can't argue. Like, I think anybody should be able to do whatever they want as long as they can do it safely and within reason. But if you're in a very populated area, things do go wrong, and that's kind of a big risk to let a tiger or a big animal or even, like, a retic get out. You know, there are risks, and we have to be understanding of that. And, like, there's some stuff like that that's hard to argue. It's hard to, mm-hmm. it's hard for me to get someone who doesn't have reptiles to understand why you should have. You should be able to keep a cobra. Right. Like that doesn't make sense. That to them, it's like me saying you should be able to keep a fireball and a live hand grenade. Like <laughs> yeah. it sounds stupid. You sound you don't sound sane or logical to them. So we have to be able to speak to them in a way that they understand it. And it and talking about the animals a lot of times isn't the way to do that. You have to do kind of different types of metaphors, different types of ways to help them understand it, relate it to things in their life, as well as show them so many of the other positive sides that the animal rights groups aren't showing them and show them that other side. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's not easy. And it's not, like I said, a herpetologist or somebody like that, it's not just going to show up and do it. Like yeah. it takes, it takes the right people knowing what to say and you can go in and say the wrong things and make it worse. 
Yeah. Well, and, that, and that's a big point that I always try to make too, is the animal rights people don't even have a grasp on what they would get rid of if they got rid of the hobby. So it's like, okay, you dis- you destroy the hobby. What else went with it? What's the collateral damage? We don't know. So, and we weren't even going to talk about this, but now I'm kind of interested. So we're going to go a little tangent <laughs> here, but as, as far as regulations go, where do you sit on, you know, what do you feel in, in herpetoculture culture should be maybe regulated? Maybe we don't say, okay, you can't own a retic, but you have to follow these rules or, or whatever. Do I, you have, have you thought that out? Yeah, I'm working on Wisconsin is where I lived my whole life until I moved to Illinois years, a couple of years ago, but, and Wisconsin is one of the last States that doesn't have an exotic law. Um, so me and us arc and mostly me, <laughs> Phil gave me a few things and it's mostly me. I am working on trying to write a law for Wisconsin. Um, because, realistically we're going to get wisconsin's going to get a lot at some point it's either going to be written by us or it's going to be written by the humane society of the united states or PETA. like in between me hsus and PETA, i'm hoping that the reptile community is more comfortable with me writing it so that's kind of what i want to do and, it, and i'm trying to make it where you can basically have whatever you want so anything any crock any the only things that i, I want to regulate is any crocodilians larger than one meter snout vent have to have a permit. That's it. You just have to have a permit. So, you know, you, you know, you can prove that you can, you have the housing in the enclosure, you have future room for them. Like you have to be able to prove that you can handle what you have. Um, and then for, uh, American alligators, I want to, I want to make them illegal to sell in person at all in Wisconsin, just because, I don't, I've never, I've never seen one in, I've seen one in the state ever that had a a good enclosure ever. And they're just too cheap and easy to get a hold of. Um, I feel like if you want to get a crocodilian, you should have to think about it first. And a hundred bucks is not enough to think about a couple thousand might be. Yeah. So when your next best options are thousands of dollars or they're insanely mean might make you think about it a little more. Um, and then all hots are going to be, I want to do permitted with, uh, ours along okay. with having, oppor- uh, having options for people to get those hours. So, yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's, it's funny the way the province next to me, I think they, or I think now they have changed the rules a little bit, but at one point the rule was just, you cannot own any venomous or constricting reptiles. And it's just like, Oh, so you can't own a Canyon sand boa, but you could have an American alligator. <laughs> Yeah. So it just makes no sense. So it, it would make a lot more sense for us to be the ones that are saying, this is fair. This is coming from someone who actually has a knowledge and an exactly. a knowledge base in this topic. And also we want to be safe too. So providing permits and whatnot is a good idea. Well, I think, I think we've kind of wrapped up on that topic. I, I don't want to go too far down that tangent because I still want to talk about VivTech and the products <laughs> that you guys have before we right. record this an entire podcast. This is the problem I have with being on every <laughs> podcast. Is I've, never, yeah. I've never hit an hour. So good luck, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're definitely not going to hit an hour. We're going over for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, maybe you could just give people just a quick list of the products you guys have right now. And maybe later in the podcast, we'll talk about some of the future ideas that you have, because I'm sure you have lots there that you want you might want to talk about. But as far as what's for sale right now, what do you guys have? Yeah. So for right now, we, we launched with a couple simple, like a couple things. Um, and I didn't, I didn't launch a ton of things at once uh, for a couple reasons. One, this is happening out of our house and I have to manage the inventory in my house. Mm-hmm. And two is because the other thing is I'm trying to do things that are a little bit more of a shock to the industry that are more technical, that are going to really bring some cool things to our, our ability to keep animals. And I want to make, if I feel like if I blasted everybody with a lot of stuff at once, it would be a little overwhelming. So I want to kind of trickle one out, one cool launch, and then let it sit and then be on podcast, talk about it, get the website all updated, get all the information and videos and really keep working on that. And then launch the next product and then get that going and get that buzz going. And we're going to kind of, we're probably going to, you're probably going to see us do that. We're going to launch, like every year we'll launch a couple things spaced out. Even if they're all ready at the same time, we'll probably space them out. Um, just to kind of, unless they go together or there's some reason to launch them. Um, but the first thing we did was the LED UV bulbs, which was crazy and awesome at the same time. And it has been a ride for sure. Um, you know, we, we ended up being the first not like the first actual company uh, to launch LED UV bulbs. And as far as I'm aware in the world, um, like there's, you can buy them online from random manufacturers in China and things like that. It's very dangerous to do. And I'm actually sure at some point why it's very dangerous to do. So you could get them, but nobody actually, no actual company had taken them on and tested them and worked them through and, 
And that's what we did. So I saw that the ability to do it was there. I found, uh, I, I worked with a bunch of different companies and worked down until we found one that I was really happy with. And we're making some tweaks as we go. Like the I'm already working on the next generation, which if the sample bulb coming does what I think it'll do, it's going to be even cooler. It's just going to be the last bulb you'll ever need for anything ever. Like that'll be wow. it. Last. It'll be, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm hoping I will be pretty, pretty close to actual, the actual similar graph, not, not weights, but similar, uh, uh, graph to actual sunlight. Mm, that's incredible. Yeah. So I'm hoping to, an ex I mean, the parts of it we need, um, but yeah, so the UV bulbs, so that was the first one and that's these guys, tiny little bulbs. So, yeah. uh, and then after that, we, we also launched with that, a UV meter. That, that one has been a challenge. Our, our, it came out. We did really well with it. I was really excited how many people. We actually sold out of them when I brought them when we launched. And I was excited about that because I didn't think. I'm like, nobody buys meters. Like Everybody talks about wanting a solar meter, but nobody's going to put up 150 bucks for our version. We sold, yeah. them, out, I mean, we sold them out in an hour and a half. Wow. Uh, and then it's been a scramble to get them back. Well, once we did, we got them back. We got them. Um, we upgraded some stuff with them. We tweaked a couple things. And then their manufacturing process changed a little bit. And for the last four months, I've been trying to get, we're trying to get them dialed back in because they, I'm not getting the accuracy that I need. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm working with that manufacturer to try and get it dialed back in. And if I don't have an answer in the next like couple weeks to a month, um, we'll be looking at other manufacturers. So that happens sometimes, but unfortunately, you know, we had tested that and worked with it for a long time and it was really good. And unfortunately they changed their process. I can't really fix that. So they're working on fixing it, but if we can't come to a good solution, then we'll probably find another company. Um, but so far, um, we're hoping to get those back in stock. And then the other thing we did was snake bags, just because it's a pet peeve of mine. Like, I swear to God, if I ever get another snake in a dirty sock or a bag that says Cobra on it, that it's scratched off, but I don't know, like every name on that bag is a venomous snake and I ordered a gecko, like... Yeah, yeah. That, that's how my boa came. It's like Gaboon Viper on it. I'm like, okay, yeah. great. <laughs> you're like, I hope that's actually what's. I hope my boa is actually in here. Yeah, you know, it like a yeah. Mix, or you know, or just the fact that it's usually crap stained and dirty, and we just yeah. keep reusing bags. And like, I thought about that as as we want to keep looking at, at and making ourselves look better. We want to improve the image we have as a hobby. I'm like, this is a, it's a, it's a fabric sack. Like, we can do better than the cheapest fabric with the cheapest string made in the cheapest shop in, <laughs> in Pakistan. Like, yeah, yeah. It's better than that. You know, so I, I made the I mean, bags there. They're, I, I didn't grab one because I didn't think about the bags. Um, but we uh, we put a loop in the side. So if you if you need to, you can actually pick it up and hang it. You can use mm. a hook to hold it. If it's an angry snake, you can hold with tongs and a hook. You can actually hold the bag open um, for somebody. Uh, and then the the strings are a nylon, almost like a not quite paracord, but they're a nylon type rope. Um, and when you pull them really tight, they actually kind of meld to each other a little bit. So it's they're incredibly hard to untie, but it also makes it really really secure. Um, so just small things like that, and then just a better thicker fabric that would look better. And then it's got um, our logo screen printed on it and our website. So like we can do those custom for people if they wanted them as well. Um, and the nice thing is for that is more like I want somebody to open, excuse me, to open up a box and it should be a presentation. This is their new pet. Like mm -hmm. we get too used to just, oh, you box it up, you ship it out, you box it up, you ship it out. This is how we do it. I ship if I'm gonna quick ship and my dirty buddy style. Animal, yeah, like if I'm gonna ship my buddy an animal, I just ship him an animal. But when I ship you a bulb, I package, I bubble wrap that bulb, I tape it up really nice. It comes with your your um any products we sent you, right? I said I, I signed the uh the the slip, like the, the receipt, I sign it and say, thank you. You know, we throw some stickers and stuff in there. And then there's a, a little paper card that comes in and says, thank you for improving your husbandry, you know, with VivTech products, something like along those lines. And it's a card that if you actually throw it out in your garden, it's got native plant seeds in it. So it'll grow like lavender and stuff mm -hmm. in your garden. Um, but like we, there's, when you open the box, that's the first thing you see. And then you get that. There's a presentation to it. Now it might not be much, but it's, it's an, for me, it's just, that's how I want to get it. That's those little things that make that a little cooler. Even when you buy stuff online from anybody, especially like Etsy or people like that, you get that little card or something. It's just that little extra touch that like, it makes it a little more special, I guess. It makes it a little bit more 
it connects you with them a little more. And I think yeah, yeah. when we're talking about pets, we really need to remember that. Like, how, like Garrett Hartle with uh, Reach Out Reptiles does an unreal job with marketing and packaging his animals. Yes, like, he does. You open this thing up and it's totally set up with your snake and a t-shirt or a mug and some stuff. Like, and it all looks nice and everything is crisp and clean. And he, it's not cheap for him to do that, but he is also not selling cheap animals so he can put that cost into it. And like, that's when you start doing that, like that's one thing too that people need to realize, like, especially for donating to US ARC or doing anything like this, money and bottom line, the dollar amount is always something people fight about. Like I need to make it cheaper. I can't do that. It's too expensive, whatever. But look at how, just how much, well, Garrett does not only with all of his marketing and stuff, but like he puts money in and he gets that money back tenfold because he's doing the right stuff with it. You know, like if you're just blowing money to blow money. Yeah. But when you're put investing, like if you were to take 5% of your, of what you sell a snake for and throw it to us arc, that's something that like I, I tell people all the time, like you're going to negotiate. If I come up to your table and that snake's 200 bucks and I say, I'll give you 190. You're not going to say no. You're going to say, yeah. So how about just don't take 190, just say, no, sorry, it's 200 or, and donate the 10 bucks. Yeah. Yeah, or, exactly. They'll just take 190 and donate the 10 bucks because it's $10 <laughs> out of 190. Yeah. You know, yeah, like it's, it's so true. Like the reptile hobby in general can do better with that presentation. And, and yeah, Garrett does an amazing job when it looks like, you know, you, I've ordered like hair, like beard products and stuff from these companies and you get the stickers and you get everything's in yep. these nice little bags and it's, you know, there's little confetti and whatnot. I'm like, oh, that's nice. Like it feels good. And I think that's that personal touch that yep. we talked about at the beginning that the big corporations just aren't able to, to pull off. Right. Well, and that's where when shipping animals, I think we've kind of gotten a little just pack it up, ship it out, pack it up, ship it out. You know, like I open a box and it's and I, I'm 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 honestly I'm 100 percent at fault of this, too. Like I've continued to look for better ways to do it. And I'm, I'm working on that because I want to do better. I want my mm -hmm. stuff to look better. Like I want to I want you to open it up and have rainbow stuffing cotton in there. that looks all cool and your bags all nested in there with some stickers and stuff. And it's a whole thing. Like it makes, I want to make that fun. It should be exciting. Like everybody does unboxing videos. And then you cut open the box and there's old newspaper and a bag covered in feces. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> like, like, yay. Cool. This smells bad. And my thing is in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, I, as far as the, because if I'm, if I was thinking about myself, okay, I want, if I was to start a reptile brand, I feel like lighting would be one of the last places I would go just because of how complicated it is. So what motivated you to start there? Because it's the most complicated part. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> it's actually, it's because honestly, it's, yeah, it is. It's because it's the most complicated part that I think has been done the ro the, the, the most incorrectly. Mm. I think lighting is the biggest struggle we have in, in the industry. Um, and I think the second biggest struggle is nutrition. So those two are the biggest things we're looking at. Like I keep getting asked, like, are you going to do cages? Not for a long time, not anytime soon. Cage. Everybody, everybody and their brother has a CNC in their garage. Every there's plenty of glass boxes out there. I have some ideas for something different. And until I can make something that's completely different, I'm not going to make another box. Just yeah. let other people do that. I want to make, I want to, I want to make everything inside that box work better. So, you know, we started with the lighting and, and one of the cool things with the, with the LED lights is we have the best distribution of UVA of any bulb, period. And that's, that was one of the coolest parts of these is your animals actually see the light and react immediately. I had a monitor freeze the second I flipped the switch, he froze, stared at the light and then without turning his head, he had his head cocked sideways pointing his eyeball right at the light, went right at it because he could see it. And then he analyzed his basking spot like he'd never seen it before. He was in this, he's been in this cage for two years. Yeah. But I just basically gave him those colorblind glasses and lightened up an entire spectrum he hasn't been able to see as well. And while I have UVA and UVB in those tanks, if you look at the UVA spectrum of most bulbs, it's a tiny spike. Ours is a really big spike and a long curve and it's a lot wider. So it covers a lot more of that spectrum. And it's really, really cool the, the the hormonal changes and stuff it's having on animals. And that's like that's UVA is actually where I wanted to focus because everybody talks about UVB, but you can supplement UVB with D3 if you had to. That's how the hobby existed before UV bulbs. You mm -hmm. can't supplement the effects of UVA. You can't. So and and they have such a massive effect on the animal's mentality, which that 
is it's it's kind of like the re- I think like the reason we don't focus on it is the same reason we don't look look at medicine in general. If you have a mental disorder or you have I have, I struggle with depression I have my whole life and I lie to a lot of people that do like but that's something that you it's a silent struggle like you can't it, it, people who are handicapped who have disorders like that or anxiety disorders it's they don't get given that same. I don't know, respect as somebody who has a physical disability. They don't get given that same credibility, I guess. Like, yes, oh, yeah. you're just, you don't, you're not really sick. Why, how could you can walk into the store? You don't need to park in, in a handicapped spot. That kind of mentality. Well, if you take that mentality and you take it and look at how we look at the world like that, and especially in the medical side. Now, when you look at our animals, the medical part of our animals, we do the same thing. We go, UVB is a need. Without it, they'll die. Because without it, we can watch them struggle watch them get sick and then watch it. They die. It happens in front of us. There's a visual thing that'll happen. It's going to happen in a sequence of events that we can track. It's a known thing. UVA affects serotonin developments in their brains and it affects the way they see their world, how they see each other. Uh, Hormones are affected by UVA, uh, breeding habits, circadian rhythm, all that stuff. We can't measure that. We can't see that. But we can, if you know what you're looking for, once you realize what you're looking for, but most of the time in standard care, you're not going to see it. Your animal eats, it's active, it moves around, but never, anybody with Amazon Trebo has ever noticed your Amazon doesn't really use the arboreal part of its enclosure that much. It mostly just hides in a spot and never moves. Throw UVA on it and your arbo- your arboreal snake will never touch the ground again. Mm-hmm. There's a huge reason that they have to pull Amazon Trebo out of trees in the rainforest. But in captivity, you can just pick them off on the ground of the tank. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, and it's, you're so right. There is the, we are much better at recognizing physical illness than mental illness. And yep. it's actually really easy to induce mental illness in captivity. And people do it to themselves all the time by not exposing themselves to proper light. I mean, that's one of the yeah. reasons, especially us up north through the winters, it's, you know, there's no sun anymore. You, you're not producing it. any yeah, vitamin so, D half the time and there's no sun. So if you, and, if, and that's, and even the D3, that's still the, that's still the, that's still the the UVB part, but like you ever notice, yeah, like exactly. the seasonal depression. We know that because we're up north. <laughs> so when you can buy seasonal depression lighting, those lights are UVA lights. That's what mm. they are. So it it because it affects us too. It's the same reason if you walk outside on a sunny day and you just like feel better, feel like you just feel like you're ready to take on the world, like you're just more aware. Then you go on a cloudy day, like it's raining and cloudy here. This is the most excited I can be, and I've got a lot of lights around. Like outside, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. just like, oh, it's cold and crappy again, dang. But like, that's the immediate direct effect of UVA on your brain. Yeah, yeah. Immediately you get the feel-good hormones and, and pumping through the body. So can you describe a little bit as far as the conceptual conceptualizing the product all the way to development? Like, what is that process like? You don't have to go into crazy detail, but yeah. um, how do you so, do that? Realistically, so when I started this, I was still under a consulting contract with Zillow. Um, when part of my contract was that any IP or like patents that I came up with period were owned by them because I was contracted with them. So I didn't really, I didn't go out to patent anything. Um, but I did know that I I don't, you don't need to patent anything to come up with something cool because the reality is a lot of times the stuff that we need to improve our, our, our husbandry and our hobby already exists. It's just used in a different part of an industry that we don't see. So it's really a lot of what I've started to, started doing now. I have a lot of ideas and things that are going to be patented and really unique in the future and build from the does design up. But a lot of this stuff is finding unique components and, and manufacturers and just working through dozens of different manufacturers and finding the and testing components and then slowly tweaking them until I get something that that is going to get close to where I want to go. And then working with that company to continue to move it there. Um, changing out uh, components, changing out colors, changing out um, shapes, distributions, you know, voltages, things like that to really take that thing that was used for something totally different and make it work for us. And that's kind of what what that process is now. It's really just a lot of back and forth and testing and tweaking and back and forth until we get what we want and then continuous uh, quality testing as we go. So every like every bulb that shows up, it's tested by the manufacturer and it gets a, a, a certification slip. Um, that we take out when we get it because we recertify it the day we get it. So every single bulb that we have is tested by our manufacturer, then tested by us, and then sent out. And then, oh yeah, as far as, so what pushed you into LED side? Was was it because 
were you trying to solve just an energy consumption issue or or where were you why why, why did you push yourself there i've been watching leds for a long time and i think that was the next natural step we all kind of thought would be coming you know is led is the next step for for lighting it is for fish and everything else plants everything's going led that's the next step for reptile but because it doesn't have heat it didn't really make sense but we knew i've known uva and uvb were out there uvb has been so expensive it just wasn't feasible really um so as soon as i realized we were going to kind of all right i was going to probably step away from zilla in a more consulting role and then um we were going to start vivtech uh we we wanted to go we because I really I knew that was a big thing and I knew it was a technology that was out there. It was just where I wanted to go first. It was something that I knew because I knew how the technology worked with LED. I knew the possibilities that exist with it. It's just whether anybody had got it there yet. Um, and it was really just okay. I'm gonna break it down and start looking. So I I got on Alibaba and Amazon and a bunch of other websites. I ordered bulbs from all over the world that were LED UV bunch of different manufacturers and stuff and started testing them. Um, I was going to say it. So like, and that, that actually kind of ended up becoming a really long road of a lot of discoveries. And I kind of knew this was possible because LED in the aquarium world is so different. It's so different on how it reads. You can't even use the same Lux meters most of the time because they don't read LED light waves like they do uh, uh, fluorescent. So like you have to, have different meters you, they you have to look at things differently and it's not the same light temperatures aren't the same thing anymore because you're creating light differently so everything about it kind of changes and it makes it a little more complicated to understand and i knew that was going to happen with this too that there were going to be some struggles on on and on, on getting people to understand led and one of those struggles kind of happened um with a, a one of the recent podcasts you did talking about LEDs and, and, and UVB and finding that, yes, if you buy any bulb offline, you don't know who made it. And one of the bulbs that I have is this one that I got from a manufacturer and it says in big letters, do not use. And I'll show you guys why when we set up the spectrometer, but um, it looks, it's just LEDs. It looks fine. The light that comes out of that is bright. The blue, the LEDs work. Um, if I tested, I tested it with the, the six point, the, uh, solar meter 6.5. So I've got that guy, both, I got both of these, both of them are, are calibrated and brand new. Um, and, uh, the, on the, on the, on the UV index, it looked, didn't look bad. I read like a, from 12 inches, I had like a, like a six, like that's pretty, pretty decent for like a desert kind of bad, you know, tr tropical to desert kind of area. I'm like, that's pretty good. So I, uh, didn't have the spectrometer yet threw it on an animal just to do long-term testing. Um, and it was off on the side of the cage. So just kind of see if he came over to that corner to react with it or anything like that. Um, and then about a month later, I got my spectrometer. Luckily, again, that wasn't his main UV. Uh, and then I put it, <laughs> it under this bulb and uh, nah, yeah, it barely has any UVB at all. Actually, most of it's in the UVC range mm -hmm. and shortwave UVB. So had I kept that on my animal long enough, his, and if it was his only source of UV, in a smaller enclosure, I'd have burned his eyeballs out. Yeah. And that is well, and that's the thing with the like you said, there's so many LED products that boast UVB production, but so many of them it's like a it's like a minefield, really. Yeah. And the reality is it really is for <laughs> the funny thing is it really is for fluorescent too. Mm -hmm. We've just gotten more used to it because it's been around for 30 years. Things can get screwed up with fluorescent too. Like it happened in 2008, a bunch of bulbs got messed up and animals' eyes got screwed up and like, yeah, especially with the coil bulbs and whatnot. And it's like, yeah, the UV or the solar meter is quite an investment, but it's really a good tool for everyone because it can happen regardless. Right. But one of the things about LED and where this kind of starts, and this actually, this is something that I talked about with Dr. Baines, and it's really frustrating for me um, because we all use the UV index to test our bulbs. I'm going to show you why that's not going to work for LED and why it doesn't actually work for any bulbs to an extent. It does. It's the best thing we can do but there's a very, very big gap in it that you need to know about because this bulb that'll screw up your animal is going to look totally fine on the UV index meter. It's not going to look bad at all. It's going to look fine. So there's, if you had that meter and you bought this bulb, there's no reason you wouldn't use it. The yeah, only yeah, reason it, I know how bad it is is because we have a photo spectrometer. Well, why don't we jump into some of that stuff then? Why don't we look at some of the science here yeah. and uh, and set that up for people so we can take a look at, at all okay, of this? Well, we can, I'll let me un... Let me turn that screen back on. 
There. Now everybody gets to see two of me. There you go. All right. So excellent. It right here is the, the fixture. You can barely see it, but there's the fixture I'm gonna hang it from. And then we've got all of our meters and stuff down here. Let me get the solar meter set up. Now the solar meter that we have has to it is calibrated, but it is not, it does not have a um it's not the entire system I have isn't fully calibrated. That's getting sent out next week. So what this is going to do, and I'll what I'll do is I'll actually share my screen on this screen so we can see it. Oh, perfect. Um, but what it's going to do is it's going to show us the light wave, and it's going to show us the strengths, but they're not actually at a unit. The unit of the the unit that you're looking at is just units, not. So I can tell like this light wave is about twice as intense as this one, but we're not going to get microwatts per square or per centimeter squared out of it. I will once I get this whole entire rig sent in. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so we can just, it's a uh, mark in the sand without having actual units yeah. attached to it. So we're going to actually, we're still going to see everything. It's still going to be a reliable look at the at the lighting and what it means. It's just not going to be a measurable look. Sure. It's quali It's not quantifiable, but it's qualitative. So yeah, yeah, makes sense. All right. Yeah, sorry, this is a lot to put together. And by the way, in case anybody's wondering, these stupid things are incre incredibly expensive. Even just... <laughs> Just sending the expensive like thing that I got in to get calibrated is like another fifteen hundred dollars. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah and yeah. the actual spectrometer would not have been cheap. No, it wasn't. And I found out that I think we might be one of the only companies that makes reptile products and has our own spectrometer, which is insane to me. And I'm the company that I just started, and I live in my. It lives in my garage. <laughs> yeah. and like companies that have billions, millions of dollars don't have one. I don't get it. But here, I'm going to, let me see how this works. I'm going to shrink my screw back here so I can get into my system. Okay. We are officially set up with the spectrometer. We're ready to rock. So anybody who's listening on the audio version, I recommend going to the YouTube at some point so you can see what Ryan's going to show us. He has a sharing a screen here and we'll try to verbally describe it as well. So if you're driving in the car, you won't feel totally in the dark, but we'll, uh, but I, it'll probably be easier to conceptualize if you do visualize it on the screen at some point. So anyway, Ryan, you can take it away. What are we looking at here? All right, so what we're looking at right now, what you're looking at is this is an Ocean Optics USB 2000 plus spectrometer. Um, this is the same thing that uh, Serena uh, uses uh, in her testing and do uh, Dr. Wonder or Serena Wonderlick uses and Dr. Baines uses, they use the same setup. Um, so this is the same exact unit they use. Now, what we're gonna start out with is looking at a typical, this is a fluorescent coil. This is a surprise, it's a Zilla coil, um, <laughs> but this is what I had in the house. So um, looking at the, this coil, it was, Interesting, this one was actually designed with Dr. Baines as, as far as I'm aware uh, back in the day. Um, but if you look at the spectrometer right here, this reading, what we're looking at right here is the UVB. So UVB uh, reusable in reptiles runs from like 295 nanometers to uh, 345. And what I want you to think about, and this is kind of hard for some people to understand what we're looking at because we're looking at what light waves of something that we can't see and that doesn't really mm -hmm. understand. So the way I would look at this is, we're looking at all of the radio stations that you can tune into with your little dial. And then what these wavelengths, these, these pieces right here are telling us is how strong that signal is. So yeah. that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the right wavelengths, which are the right radio stations, and which ones we want to have strong signal. Now, what for, so for reptiles, the UVB, like I said, lands from 295 to 345. So that's all through here. So you see with a fluorescent, you get on here, I'll put it really close. So don't look, I was, I was telling Dylan, don't look at the, the intensity of this, um, but you can look at uh, uh, the wavelengths because this will show what wavelengths this puts off. So there's a couple the things. The shape of the graph doesn't change regardless yeah, of the look, intensity. It's just the intensity. Everything gets taller, yeah. but the shape doesn't change. So, but if I get it really close, it'll kind of help me show it a little easier. And then I'll pause it. So here, all right. So what we've got right here, is a lot everything from like 450 up and up into the 750 like that's all your visible spectrum um that's what we actually see that's what a lot of your plants are going to use and things like that um there's spikes in some of these areas just based on the phosphors that are mixed with inside the bulb that's how they pick where these spikes are and where these where these are is completely based on the chemical mixture of the phosphors that are inside this bulb this glass bulb mm -hmm. if you change the chemical composition you change the way the, the wavelength looks and how that happens, and this will explain a little bit about why the, all these bulbs are different. Um, all bulbs currently, and the way that they produce UV, is a an excited electron hits some other molecule, 
and they have a, a, a reaction that causes them to send out wavelengths of light that we can't see. We can see those reactions that hit those molecules that create wavelengths of light we can see. So what you see out of a fluorescent bulb is tiny little electrons shooting around in there and hitting uh, molecules of phosphors. And when they hit them, those phosphors burn up. And in that chemical, uh, uh, in that chemical uh, reaction or that reaction, uh, it produces these light waves. Um, so over time, that's why your UV bulb degrades over time is because those chemical reactions burn up that material. And over time, there's less of it and less of it and less of it and less of it. So that's what happens. Um, so that's what these phosphors do. So right here, you've got your UVB and there's a big spike in the lower, in the lower section right here, about 305, 310. And then it carries out all the way through down into 350. Um, the, this section of UV, uh, is, is used to, um, stop the overproduction of D3. And there's some studies out there that show, um, they're, they're not totally sure exactly what portion of that is necessary to do that. So there's some studies going on, it, on with it and as well as with our bulbs to see, um, cause we're a little weaker on that portion of it, but that's the only portion of the, of the spectrum we're a little weaker on. Um, we're looking at the long term of what that'll do. Um, so then right here, you've got your UVA and UVA is kind of like through right here. So you've got a couple big spikes, but not, you're missing a lot of it. And a lot of it, there's nothing. And you're looking at really short, very defined spikes. The other thing to notice with this, and this is with all, every single fluorescent bulb, all of them, all mercury vapors and all metal halides is this right here. It's not a lot, but all of them have UVC and shortwave UVB, at least some of so them. There's basically a tiny little spike at what, like 255 nanometers yeah. or something like that? And, and yeah. Zilla is actually, out of all the bulbs I've tested, Zilla's actually got one of the it's got a really, really good, very, very low UVC spike. Just to get that tiny dot, you saw how close I had to be to the bulb. So yeah, yeah. their UVC output's very, very low. It's actually one of the reasons I used their bulb before I made better ones. Um, so that's your typical coil. So that's basically any fluorescent you're going to be looking at is like that. Now, this is the Sure Sun VivTech jungle cover. So this is what will be like our tropical bulb. I refuse to call it tropical or desert because those nomenclatures in the hobby are garbage because the yeah. highest UV needing animal on the planet lives in the Caribbean, not in the desert. So yeah, cyclera, point. cyclera iguanas need more UV than any other living animal. And they live on the white sand beaches in the Caribbean, which is not too deserty and a little more tropical. <laughs> yes. I think you're right about that. <laughs> but, there's a little more humidity in the air. Right. And, and there's got to be more, we got to start thinking about things differently than like the two habitats is the dunes of the Sahara and the rainforest floor. Cause there's other stuff in between that. Well, and even when we take that too far too, you make all these, you know, arid setups, completely arid and void of moisture. And then the animals just desiccate there and you go, well, it's supposed to be a desert animal. Well, in the wild, it's burrowing deep into a moist hide. It's oh. doing all these things and it exactly. does rain sometimes. And yeah. Yeah. That's right. why, that's why none of these are called desert or tropical. And I don't think the word desert or tropical is on the boxes even because what we wanted people to do is stop thinking about whether it's a desert animal or a tropical animal, because realistically the bulb that I made for frogs for like dart frogs works great for dart frogs at 12 inches. The bulb for like cyclera works really good for dart frogs too at three feet. So it depends on the yeah. size of your enclosure and what you want to use it for, you know? So it, it really just, it depends more on what zone you need to get your animal in and how close it's going to be to it. That's how you pick the bulb, not desert or tropical. Anyway, side side rant um yeah. but here so this i love this look how clean that is yeah, that's cool so that is a vivtech sure sun midday blaze so what you'll see here is you'll see of 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 much it's a it's not as like weight as long and plateaued it's a lot more spiked um, in the UV. So it's right in the, right about 310. So we run our UV from about 295 to 320 is really what it covers, but it peaks at about 310. Um, right now we're working to add more into this section. Again, that's kind of where you, the overproduction of D3 is stopped. However, again, we're trying to see, I haven't seen any negatives with it. And we have animals that have been on tests for over a year and they haven't had any problems, um, but we are testing it in a lot of long-term tests to see we really want to find out what are those portions in that spectrum and what can we use it for? What do they need um, and how can we improve it? So we are actually, I have samples coming with potentially some new LEDs that aren't really out there 
um, that they might be that we're working on with a manufacturer to fill that section in. So we'll okay. see how it goes. Um, yeah, actually, let, let, let's linger there for a second because I think that was you know sort of the two main concerns with LED UVB. The first is the UVC, which we can see there's none there's here. Zero. Uh, yep. Yeah, it's a it's a flat line at the bottom, which is great. And then the second thing is this. Uh, this concept that the longer wavelengths of UVA or of UVB and UVA are what you know pump the brakes for the D3 synthesis, and it, it's it seems like yeah, there's it's more theoretical at this point, but yeah. there there is some science to show that that's probably the case. So I guess my question would be, well, for, first, are you doing are planning on doing any blood testing or anything with animals right now just to see where their 25 hydroxy vitamin D is? You are. Yep. Can and you talk actually, a little bit about that? Well, so what we had, what we had tried to work on is I, I know, like, again, knowing that this is an issue and, and, and I talked to Dr. Baines about it because I knew it was like in Serena, we had, when, when I sent them the bulbs and they did the test, we were talking a lot about them. And, and I, I greatly appreciate both of them and their input. They've been phenomenal. And, and, and it's been really cool because we want to change things. So that's one thing that's been really nice with both of them too is, and I think why they're more, I don't know, open to talking to us is I want to know how I can make it better. I don't want to hear their... Right. I don't want to hear their their opinion and then post it out how they love it. I want to hear I can make it better. I'm never going to be satisfied until they go, there's nothing better you can do, Ryan. Like until I get to that point where I've turned put the sun inside this little box, like I'm not mm-hmm. going to be happy. Um, and I appreciate their their, their input. So uh, through talking to Dr. Baines, she kind of said we kind of talked about how a really good study on the UV in reptiles hasn't really ever been done, not in the way we need it to, because we're always looking at just specific pieces and they always usually focus on like the short wave or the long wave short wave uvb right because that's they need that they have to have mm-hmm. that or they die and again that's that mentality of we see it we know it we, they need it so there's other pieces they're starting to learn more about so yeah we're, we're we're looking at there's a university um and i'm uh uh friends with the head of the zoology and biology department uh, and he has a lot of grad students that need things to do. So we're working mm-hmm. on some cool grad student projects. To I think we could figure out who that might be just by <laughs> thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We probably could talk. Yeah, once we get this stuff going, it'd be cool to talk about later too. Um, yeah, yeah, cool. But we're definitely trying to. We'll be putting up some some stuff like that. We're uh, we're working with some other universities and friends to do a lot of tests. And, and honestly, we're even looking at uh, stuff that has nothing to do with our bulbs. Like um, I'm le- working with one. I want them to do. It, I'm trying to find a way for them to do it because generally their students aren't like a student project is, has a timeline and this would be a little bit longer. Um, but I want them to do like bearded dragon joint health, uh, on loose substrate versus tile, Mm, like things we don't think about, like, yeah, they don't ingest it, but now do they have arthritis and horrible joints because they've been on a hard surface their whole life? Yeah. You know, like probably, but yeah, that's exactly that's, that's a more likely thing than, impaction like yeah, exactly every bearded dragon on tile gets arthritis one in ten thousand on sand gets impaction like what do you want to do yeah exactly yeah. yeah so like that kind of stuff i want to answer some of those kind of questions but with the lighting too yeah it's really we want to look at more long-term studies and the nice thing too is unfortunately it sucks erica couldn't be on here with me uh she was busy but erica uh erica mcveigh my wife who is the ceo of vivtech um actually has been a certified veterinary technician for almost 15 years and has exclusively worked with exotics, including working for Brookfield zoo. So like there's very few people in this country that know more about reptile medicine than her, including veterinarians. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so she's pretty stoked about all this and she digs into all the medical side of it. And um, yeah, we're working on that kind of stuff, but like, but yeah, so we're looking at hoping to figure that out. And then I'm already working right now, like I said, with our manufacturer on making some chips that would fill that in. Um, and we might actually be going to a bigger bulb housing so I can do more chips and fill more wavelengths. Um, so we're looking yeah, so at what's the problem right now? Like why, why is there a gap there? Is it because we don't have an LED bulb technology right now that can produce a, a wavelength there? It's, or it's, what's it the honestly deal? is because the, the, the diodes that are available, the diodes that are okay. available, there just isn't, there's no need for that wavelength for anybody else for anything really. And that's, that's one thing to remember too, with reptile, which this is kind of what makes it hard. We talked about earlier with the hobby and, and things it, what, th- one thing that does make it hard for reptile to innovate is it does make it difficult because if I want to get those LEDs and no one else in the world needs them, I have to pay a company to make them just for me. And they're not going to be 10 cents a piece. They're going to be $50 a piece. Mm-hmm. So like, it's very cost prohibitive to do a lot of stuff like that. And that's where it gets difficult. So that's why 
this, you know, both any bulbs that are out there, none of the LEDs I think have that yet um, yeah. because that diode doesn't really exist. Now I found one, my man, my manufacturer is looking through their, through their, you know, contacts manufacturers for LEDs and found one that we're pretty sure is going to do what I need to do. Um, and if not, we may be able to get them to tweak it. And then I'm basically just going to take out a loan and buy what I need to buy a lifetime supply of that diode and then try and get the cost down as much as I can. Um, so l- let me ask you a little bit of a tougher question then. So let's, let's say theoretically worst case scenario without the longer, the waves of UVA, or I guess the shorter waves of UVA, there is a hypervitaminosis D3 issue. What what are next? What's the next steps? Because you know, like you said, there's a few brands that all have a, a similar spike or similar uh, spectrum. Yeah. And if that is going to cause vitamin hyper uh, hypervitaminosis, what what are the next steps? I mean, realistically, uh, it's it, it, it it's it's a it's a little nervous, man. I I I think we all are. Like, I've done enough testing with it on my own animals. We've done we haven't seen anything happen, and and I'm comfortable. That's the only reason I was comfortable enough knowing this to let it out. Um, um, to release them is I know that that it's not having any effects on the animals we're testing um, and watching. Uh, their 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 blood levels all look great. Everything looks great. So um, and with like I said with Erica, I, honestly I wish Erica was here. She could definitely touch a lot more on that because um, mm-hmm. I just tell her she just she tests she tracks it and tells me things are good and I high five when I walk through them. Like, <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. but no, I mean realistically. I think what the, the biggest concerns right now is, is it's not that it'll actually cause, it, it is that it would cause hypervitaminosis, but the other part of it, it's, it's more that if you measure it at, if you keep it equivalent to fluorescent. So if you keep the the length equivalent to fluorescent, basically because it's missing that, the, 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 the solution to it might be, if it became a problem would be you just, we need to add distance to the UV. So instead of being at, say you want to hit a UV index for your bearded dragon of 5, 5.0 on your spotlight, and you're getting 5.0 out of our ball, but we're fi- we find out that over time, you know, years from now, that maybe this has some tendency to have an issue, then instead of, you know, being at 12 inches, now you're at 14, and you're not at 5.5, you're at 4.8, but that is going to end up giving you the same amount. So it might end up being a shift to kind of a shift to the Ferguson zones, as well as honestly, I'm already trying to make sure we can fix it just because whether they need it or not, isn't my question. It's whether they get access to it in the wild or not. And that's more my concern because I think when you look at supplements are a good example. If we only look at what the animals need to survive, then we miss out on a lot of UV is the same thing. We We continue to only look at what they need to survive then we're going to miss out on the things that create enrichment and better lives for them and better health for them and better everything because we're only looking at the bare minimum. And that's one thing I think in the hobby, especially in the States that it's, it's changing significantly, but for a long time, it just, it was about how many animals you could have and not how they were kept the best. And it was just, it was very, keep it alive. Like a care sheet. I tell everybody like, Oh, do you have a care sheet for those? I'm like, a care sheet is a one week, how not to kill your animal in a week. That's it. Yeah, at, at the yeah. end of your week, you're, if you haven't done more research, you're in trouble. Because in one page, all I can do is tell you how not to kill it. Mm-hmm. That's it. Exactly. I, can't, I can't help you understand there, the, anything more than just it won't die in a week with this piece if of paper. If you do these things. Yeah. yeah. Nothing about natural history. Nothing about how to make it thrive. Exactly. exactly. And so so we've got to get more to, the, like, I love it when people come up and they're like, oh, my animal doesn't need UVB. And I'm like, oh, hold on. It might not need it to be alive, but is that your standard? Of, <laughs> yeah. Is your standard of care not dead or yeah. thriving and breeding and living and growing and healthy? Because if your standard of care is not dead, then I can tell you a bunch of ways you can save money. Like you literally can put it in a duct tape shoebox if you want. Yeah, like, exactly. And that is one of the standards we sit on all the time in the hobby is not dead. Like, for example, I had some pothos that I just gave up on. I moved and I just let them basically not die under no light or anything. And then I, it was like two weeks or three weeks. And I'm like, you know what? I feel bad for this plant. And I put it in water and it started sprouting sprouting roots again. But, you know, some, that example of the plant wilting and the roots drying up and, you know, that technically wasn't dead. It still came back to life when I gave it water three weeks later, but it certainly was not thriving. And I think a lot of reptiles are in that shriveled heart is still beating, but that's about it. 
Exactly. And it sucks because they're so good at hiding how hurting, how much they're hurting or how sick they are. You yeah. don't know until it's too late. You're not, you're, you're just, you're not going to get what you think. You're, you're in trouble. Mm-hmm. Like by the time you know your animal's sick, it's already probably dead. It just hasn't yeah. died yet. Yeah. You know, so well, anyway, so here, so this is, so this kind of all comes back to you with it. When we're looking at this UV, so this is when, when John was on your podcast and talked about the, the negatives of UV and LED, and, and he was right on, a, on what he talked about with that study on the bulb. But what that bulb was, was kind of what I started doing. I had to go out to all these manufacturers, order their bulbs, get samples, start looking at what they were, how they were constructed, materials. Uh, I took them apart, looked through the components. You know, I really needed to understand the quality of the bulbs, what they did, their outputs, et cetera. So I got one bulb and I thought this thing, like I said, looked awesome. It has a ton of LEDs in it. It gives off a ton of light. It's super bright. And then I tested it with my UV index meter and it looked great. And I was like, huh, cool. That sounds awesome, right? So I started testing it. And this was before I had my spectrometer. Now I'm going to raise this thing up because I need to get it up higher so that I can show you the UV index. So let's see here. So if I take this, we're at about, we're at about 10 inches here, all right? So if I do t- at 10 inches, I can show this to you guys, but you might not even be able to see it. I don't even know if you can see it. But no, we'll take promise, your word for it. I promise it's at 7.5. So it's at 7.5 right there. Now for so 7.5. UVI is 7.5 are about 10 inches below the bulb. Yeah. So, I mean, that'd be good for like for us on a spotlight. If you're looking at the Ferguson zones on a spot, that's a good, that's a good range for like getting into a, a desert species right underneath it. Like that'd be perfect for your bearded dragon to sit there. All right. Now, and now if we look at a, the, the 6.2, the UV, UVB meter, I get 17 microwatts for most people. It's putting out UV and it looks good on the UV index meter. Big problem with that for me, and because I know, is that if it's a desert bulb and it's like it's you're going like seven and a half in UV index, that's a pretty strong output. It should have a lot stronger UVB than that. It should be up near 50 to 100, and it's not. But I know that, and I have both. And this is why both is important because now I'm going to show you the spectral reading of this thing. So now we're going to take this and lower it so you can get it nice and strong. If we do this, yeah, I'm like, this thing's like, I'm like in the bulb. Yeah. There. So now if we look at this, UVB that reptiles use is here. There's nothing. This is so basically all- we're seeing a, we're seeing a spike below 300. So it looks like maybe 275 or something, a peak at. That is the shortwave UVB that causes photokeratinitis and burns out reptiles eyeballs. Mm. So, and then this is the UVA, which again, the rest of it's not bad. The UVA is not great, not bad. It's all one spike. It's in a good spot. No big deal. It's this though. But the problem, the problem that, that I'm trying to really focus on is really if I, if I only use a UV index meter, I use the, the 6.5, which everybody uses, this, I would have put that bulb on my animal and not mm-hmm. thought twice about it because it looked great. That meter yeah. says I should use this bulb. This spectrometer that you have to use to actually see the light tells me that that bulb will absolutely kill my animal. Yeah. And without yeah, having, I think as I don't yeah. think we I think we were talking about this before uh, maybe off air but for people that don't understand the UVI index is a measure for talking about sunburn in humans. So yeah. that's so, why the UVI is so high when you measure it it's like okay that's great but that's why it's so high because you're into the you know short length UVB it's going to cause burn. Right. Well and that's the thing with like the UV index in the Ferguson zones that I appreciate it. I appreciate that we have ways to measure but just like everything else in our hobby, we're MacGyvering something to make it work for us. It's not mm-hmm. made for us. It is made to work. The It's the best thing we can use. So the UV index, like you said, it was created by, props to you guys, Canadian, uh, created by a Canadian meteorologist to, uh, nice. to, to, yeah, to tell you how, based on the fairness of your skin, are you going to get a sunburn? Um, but the reason that, that that works for us is because it's focused on shortwave UVB which is what causes sunburns for us. So UVB is what, it's not UVC, it's UVB what causes sunburns, it's that short wave, and that's the most detrimental. UVC is mm-hmm. a sterilizer. We never see that here, but that's what's in like your UV sterilizers, right? Yeah. So yeah, that short wave, yeah, it's it's just- It's no good. 
No good. It's bad news. So this bulb. So this is why the graph should be sold with the bulb too, right? Like, cause yep. not everybody has the 2000 USB ocean thing at home, yeah. obviously. Well, and that's, that's where one of the things that I wanted to kind of, like I said, point out is like the UV index is a great tool, but as you can see with this, you cannot effectively check your UV without both. Mm -hmm. The UV index is going to give you a good idea of the, 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 the health of the UV you're getting. The, the purity or, you know, making sure that the UV you're getting doesn't have shortwave UVB or UVC. If that you, if this little UV, uh, shortwave UVB spike was a little higher, you would have immediately known it's no good, you know, because it would have right. a little bit higher would have caused that to quadruple. So you'd have been reading 20 or 30 at 10 inches, which would have been mm -hmm. way off. So that would have been a good, like, you know, red flag. However, because it looks good on this, you wouldn't use it. But then when you put the UVB under it, just knowing that, like, for me, I would, I know that. I know that desert bulb, if I'm up in that that range of the UV index, my UVB should be 50 or higher, not mm -hmm. 15. And then that's where I can go, okay, something's a little off with that. It's not right. Um, but realistically, without without the, the graph, you can't know. And that's where it gets scary with all bulbs is – you have to buy these from a manufacturer like us or Zilla, Zilla, Zoomed, Arcadia, whoever, because we actually did these tests and we are showing you on the side of the box and promoting this is the wavelength. And like, I'm liable. I can't lie to you and put a cool wavelength on the side of the box and then put it out. Yeah. There. Like I get called out immediately, you know? So yeah. we have to put that out there. But when you buy on Amazon or you buy online and it's just a bulb from somewhere, you have no clue whether that graph is real or not. You have no way to test it. Um, and if it's some random place out of China, what are they, what are you going to do? Sue them? Like they don't yeah, care. That's not happening. No, so, they rip off things all the time. Yeah. So that's, that's where LED UV isn't bad and it's not going to kill your animal and it's not awful. It's like saying that all UV, all LED UV is are bad. UV is bad. It's kind of like saying like, well, my Chevy little tiny car can't pull a semi trailer. So nothing can pull a semi trailer. Well, no, you <laughs> yeah. just need a different vehicle that's manufactured and made to do that. So that's what you're looking at is you're like, everything's not the same just because it has wheels and an engine. All lights aren't the same just because they have chips and lights. You need to know what they're doing. And, and you, you have to really go with a, a company that's done that research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. So I guess next steps, as far as you're concerned to try to fill out that, that spectrum a little bit further. Yep. And then, so where do you see your bulb sitting in, in a lighting, like a lighting setup for right now? So if someone has, if, obviously it's not a one, all in one because you're going to be missing some halogen and some infrared. So you had mentioned at the beginning that you were thinking that you might have a bulb that could do it all. Were you also including infrared in that? No, or? So I, I, uh, I want to, I want to, <laughs> I'm hoping I can. Um, okay. Realistically, uh, what I think is going to end up happening is, um, I, I'm working on trying to get heat. If you, we do, heat, we're not going to be able to do heat and LED in the same bulb. It's just not going to happen. Unfortunately, because LEDs, once they get over 110 degrees, start to degrade significantly. Their yeah, lifespan okay. degrades really fast. Um, so I can't, <laughs> I just can't, I can't make a bulb that'll not be over hundred degrees, but heat enclosure. However, I can make a fixture that would put the bulbs separate and far enough away with some potential heat you know, heating material or yeah, heat, yeah. Uh, insulation um, to be able to do that. So there is some things I'm, I'm looking at um, right now, to be honest, I'm kind of just trying to find, I'm more focused right now on finding different ways to utilize these LEDs. Um, mm -hmm. Doing a, for now, the, honestly, the best types of heat already exist. Like the halogen type par 38 lights really do give some of the best infrared spectrums for any bulb. And everything else I found isn't, any isn't a lot better. There's not anything that I'm finding that's better. And I don't want to just launch something to launch it. I want to find something that we can improve in some way. So I found a few different types of, of lighting that don't really exist in the hobby at all. Um, they don't even really exist in our homes or our lives. They're in like manufacturing. Um, mm -hmm. But it would allow me to create very, very low profile lighting because they're it's a they're types of tubes that produce heat. Um, so I can do them really, really small and really short and really like do some unique stuff with them. So I'm hoping uh, to look at some of that. Um, I'm looking at heat projectors and things like that, just different op opportunities for, for heating. But a lot of it, like I said, a lot of it exists. And I don't want to launch something that already exists. 
unless I can improve it in some way. Um, so really we're keeping an eye on the, on the bulbs. Um, and the next step is uh, uh, full light length strip lights. Um, okay, however, yeah. I, I hate tube lights. I hate them. I think they're the worst thing that happened to the hobby, except they were the best thing that happened at the time. And they're great. But that was 30 years ago. <laughs> like, two, what I don't like about tube lights is, is you, what you're doing is, the idea behind it is we provide them with lower outputs of UV over a longer period of time in order for them to get the UVB that they need. So in the wild, obviously, that's why we don't have sunlight type bulbs, because they need to be able to escape that or they die very quickly. So we did tubes and a tube is that was the first bulb that existed. Fluorescent bulbs already existed. Gary worked to make them for UV and it was amazing. And we had 1993, 94, we got UV bulbs. When you put that bulb over an enclosure, you're covering that entire enclosure with consistent UV and not just consistent, like consistently there. It's the same measurement across the entire tank. So it's a flat, there's no gradient. The gradient is vertical. And if you have a, Somebody that buys a 55 gallon tank and puts their bearded dragon in it and du typical bearded dragon setup where it's a water bowl and a food bowl and it's tile and there's a half log on the other side and nothing else. That animal has no escape from UV. It has no gradient. It can barely get away from it. And it's basically torturing that animal with living in Alaska in the summer forever. Like you're destroying its circadian rhythm and so many other things. It, it becomes, it, they end up hiding a lot and they just have problems because of that realistically in the wild there's consistent uv over everything the difference is there's trees and fog and clouds and tons of different pieces that you're not thinking about that we can't recreate or that we can but like with a very basic setup most people don't when we do planted tanks or we do even a big build out i've got branches everywhere and plants everywhere there's filtration there's different gradients of uv throughout that entire enclosure um, but that's why I really like spotlights is spotlights create that for you without the need for them to know why the average, the, the average entry level keeper doesn't understand that. So instead I say, do a spotlight that animal, especially let's say bearded dragons, that, that animal evolved for millions of years, evolved an eyeball on the top of its brain that looks through a hole in the top of its skull and self-consciously regulates its UV for it. And then you're going to say in your 10 minutes of knowledge that you know more than it does about UV and what it needs. Yeah. Like instead give them gradients and let them use their belt body and their, what they do. They, they know how to exist. We, they exist in the wild by themselves without our help. The problem is we put them in a box and then we try and mimic their habitat and we screw it up so bad that we have, pro they have problems. They're not doing anything wrong. We screwed it up. So instead I kind of tell everybody, Look at where they live and then give them a gradient of everything you can measure. Heat gradient, UV gradient, humidity gradient, depths of dirt gradients, like everything. Everything should have a gradient so that they can find every niche that they need at any point when they need it. And by using a spotlight, you really create that. You create a gradient that's top to bottom and side to side. And a lot of times that's what they're going to do. They're going to pop out on a rock right in the sun, get blasted with the hot, the heaviest sunlight they can get. And then they're going to jump away and hide. And with this, it allows them to go to the side of the cage, get up, get their UV, and then get away from it if they want to, which is important. And a lot, especially with studies recently showing that they regulate UV independent of heat, that if you only give them heat and UV or you just cover everything, like you're not allowing them to truly regulate what they need. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's a really good point. And I'm actually starting to see a lot a lot of people create more of these basking zones, uh, you know, with the heat ball was conventional too, but now I'm starting to see people with like very high intensity visible, visible light with LEDs as well. And then shining that down onto the same spot where their halogen shining. And then of course there's a UVB tube on top, but that's creating this really intense zone and the visible lights really was sending the animal there a lot of the times, cause that's what they're sensing. So it, it is, that is a really interesting concept and I could see that kind of taking off, but then you said you were, we were also looking at doing yeah. strips. So instead. I'm looking so, at, so, so that'd be shorter strips. <laughs> Oh, and we're going to do long strips, but I, oh, I hate strips, but everybody wants them because that's what they're used to. And if, if I'm going to fight between you buying better UV or not buying better UV just because of the style it's in and because I don't like the style, I'm not okay with that. I still want to provide everybody the best they can, but I refuse to just put out something that's the same as a tube because there's a, fa there's a failure in that thought. And I want to fix it. So what we're going to, what our strips are going to do, they're actually going to have a gradient built into them and it'll have right on the top basking side, non-basking side. 
So it'll go from say 90 microwatts down to 10 slowly across the whole tank. That way it'll give your tank an entire, you have full coverage, your animal has a gradient, you have a high zone where you can set your heat bulb next to, and it'll cover everything you need, but it'll allow the animal to get away from it. And the people who are buying that light don't even need to know why the gradient exists. All they need to know is your heat bulb goes by this side. Yeah. Done. Simple. And now those animals are going to have a, and that's kind of a way I look at a lot of the products we're doing. I've stopped, I've stopped being frustrated that people don't do enough research because we don't, they don't have a trigger to do research. Like if I buy dog, this is something I've talked to people a lot in the last couple of months. If I go buy dog food at the store, I, my wife tells me she, my dog's allergic to chicken and lamb. So I can't, or fish, I can't use fish and chicken. <laughs> so I know the proteins I can use. I go to the store, I look at the proteins. There's three bags that have what I need. This one's expensive. This one's cheap. This one's in the middle. I maybe I Amazon review real quick, make sure that, you know, they didn't kill a whole bunch of dogs recently, but there's no recalls. <laughs> and then I just pick whatever bag look, looks good and sounds good and is priced right. And I leave. I don't become a dog nutritionist in the weeks leading up to buying dog food. Yes. I just, I, 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 I expect that that company has dog nutritionists and they're on the store. So they have public view. They can't be putting out garbage. You just kind of, that's the American buying experience for anything. Now take that experience and they have the same experience when they go into Walmart or anything else and the same experience when they go into a pet store to get their first pet. You go down an aisle and there's all of the stuff that you need and it's all made by the same companies who are reptile companies. And then you buy a kit that says complete bearded dragon kit. And then you get a, a piece of paper handed to you that says care guide. What about yes. that says you need to know more and you're not quite ready yet? Nothing. All of that says exactly. you got this. Good luck. Yeah. You know, and that's what we're doing. Now look at salt water. Like we were talking about aquariums earlier. If I came out and said, Dylan, you want to do a salt water tank? If you've never done one, you're going to be like, no, they're expensive. There's <laughs> a lot of work. They're hard to do. I'd need to research it first. Like marine aquariums really locked that in. They're not hard. I do two water changes a year on my tank and it looks better than when I took care of it. What? Wow. Yeah. Like <laughs> that's a whole other podcast. Well, I know, but like once you get an aquarium set up and you understand the basics, you just leave it alone and you let it do its thing. And once in a while, you yeah, yeah. do something. I feed my fish when I remember. Like, and he's awesome <laughs> yeah. and he loves it and he's doing great and he's healthy. But like that, that, that stigma to it is a trigger. That is a trigger that immediately makes anyone go, Ooh, that's a little bit, I want to, I, I want to dump into it. I'll, I'll waste money. I, I won't do well. I need to learn. We didn't do that with reptile. We just kept pushing as a, as an industry. It's easy. Anybody can do it. It's easy. Anybody can do it. Basic kit, basic, easy, 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 easy. And then we made it so easy that you don't know how to do it right. Mm -hmm. And now we've gone yes. too far one way and we're causing, we caused an enormous amount of problems for ourselves with animal, like animal neglect and just not doing well with animal husbandry. And, and just a lot of that stuff failed because of that. And, and that's why I stopped being frustrated that people don't do their research first. Because why would they? I wouldn't. If I didn't know better, I wouldn't. Well, and it's, it, it's such a good point because we get frustrated from our side, but yet you, like the point you made is me, when I go buy other things that aren't reptile related, I don't do research. I yeah. just go buy the thing. It's like that car part is on sale. I need it. It's going to go in my car. I assume it's fine. And, and I've always, I made that point before on the podcast, like it would be very difficult to convince a non-reptile person that a lot of the items in the pet store are not great for your reptile. Right. That just doesn't compute. It's like, why would that be? It doesn't make any sense. Exactly. And and there's like, I said, it's, it's, yeah, we've created this like veil that just makes everything seem easy, but we kind of covered up that it's not. And the, the reality is I don't think that's wrong. I don't think that saying reptiles are easy is wrong, but it shouldn't be that they're easy and anybody can do it. It should be that they're less maintenance than a dog and they're more rewarding in the fact of your knowledge base and learning. People who have amazing saltwater tanks, like when you go talk to them, you learn just because of what they had to learn to do it. And, it, and it's mm -hmm. incredible, their knowledge and how that works. The same thing can happen to, re same thing happens to reptile people. We just don't put it in that same context. And, and then they go into a, when they hit that point, they're in the, in the, in the marine aquarium world, you're, you're put in with all these other people that are at that same level that are really digging in, that are starting to go deeper and deeper into possibly even breeding these fish in, 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 in tanks, which is a monumental accomplishment over breeding crested geckos. 
Like, you know, like <laughs> yeah. that's a huge deal. And people just keep taking it further. And then in the hobby, you get your tank and you get excited and you learn about shows and you go to a show and you talk to a guy and you bought a ball python and he tells he sells you a rack with one tub. There are one tub <laughs> yeah. racks that exist. Yeah. I like know. so that you can what put it hell? underneath your bed and forget you have a reptile. Yeah, exactly. And 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 then all the stuff that's there, all that we all push people to be breeders and just do this and have as many as you can. And I have hundreds of snakes at home and that's what makes me cool. And then they go and they try to do that, but they don't understand it because they don't have the 20 years of knowledge of my understanding of why a rack can work. A rack can work if you have the knowledge that I have of all of the reasons it doesn't work. You know, and an entry level person doesn't have that knowledge. So when they go up to all of those products, they don't have that knowledge and we're expecting them to use it like they do. So that's why Vivtex products are all designed with, I don't want you to have that knowledge and I'm not expecting you to have that knowledge. I have it because I've been doing this my whole life. So why don't I put that knowledge into the product so you don't need it and make it work for you? And that's how it needs to be. Not what can we get and hope that they learn how to use it? What can we give them that will work? And then as they learn, they'll learn why it works so well. Yeah, it's almost like, We'll, we're lucky if they to choose to do the research, but if they don't, the animal's still going to be okay. Exactly. And that's how we need to look at it. And my five-year goal, and I tell everybody this because I want to be held accountable and also because I want my my my, my uh, competitors to be a little scared because it's going to happen because I don't fail, uh, <laughs> is uh, I, want, I want at some point, Dylan, you're going to buy the VivTech Habitat. And it's just going to be a box. And it's just, you're going to buy a box at a store and you're going to take it home. And you're going to add the store. You're going to click a thing on the box. And it's going to say, what pet are you putting in here? And you're going to click a species. It's going to give you a list of other things you need to pick up. You're going to take it all home, put the box where you want it, plug it in, click an app. It's going to sync it all. And then it's going to tell you what you need to do to set it up. Then you're going to put in your animal and hit go. And it's going to control everything. Your heat, your humidity, your lighting, your controls. The app's going to have, you know, it's going to send you messages. Did you feed your animal? Did you clean your water bowl today? You know, and then have a quiz in it where like, the more points you make, the cooler swag you get from VivTech and stuff that would in, entice people to learn and entice people to interact with their animals. Or, you know, if you get so many points, you win a free video camera that can go in your tank so you can watch your pet when you're at school. Like, we can do tons yeah. of stuff like that and entice people to want to learn. Because the more they learn, the more products they're going to buy anyway. So why yeah. not continue to help them do that? It's not. It's something that most companies look at as invaluable because you can't... A lot of those things, shows, education, blogs, you can't quantify the return on it. Mm-hmm. And it's imp- so it's really hard to push them, but I know the return on it and I don't need it to be quantified to know that it exists. So I, I think that's where we need to be putting our, our time and effort is, is there. Yeah. Well, it's like um, Chaz from Snakes and Adders. One of the things that he has is he doesn't sell you on the first day you walk into the store. And that seems very counterintuitive, but he knows that he's building a client and he's building a customer that's going to constantly come back for more information and more things. So it makes a lot of sense. And and that that product that you just described did sort of exist at one point in Canada. I forget what it was called. Did you ever see that? It was a Kickstarter. It was kind of like this little cube thing that was supposed to be all synced. And it it really went under. I don't think it really worked. It was... Biopod. Yes. That's that launched that's all it. over the place that. So yeah, this will be very, very, very different from that too. Um, Cause there's another basic, I think we keep all reptiles wrong. All of them, everyone, no matter how well you're doing bioactive, still wrong. <laughs> and the reason I think that is let's say you set up a 20 gallon long for a kid that wants a, uh, a leopard gecko, right? Let's say whatever, 40 breeder, nice, huge cage for a leopard gecko. And you're going to literally make this thing look like the side of the, hillside in Iraq, right? Walks and bushes and all this stuff. And then over here, you've got a food and a water bowl or whatever. And then over here, you've got some kind of hide that you've made in, even you've built into this enclosure corner, right? And that, that leopard gecko spends 95% of its time in that hole. And that hole represents 5% of its enclosure. That's, that's like designing your house to all be bathroom. And the bathroom is your kitchen, living room, di- and bedroom. Yeah, It makes no sense. Why would you design your habitat to be where you spend 5% of your time is the majority of it. But that's what we do because that's how we look at their habitat. We look at their habitat through our eyes, which is a macro habitat. We look at a picture of the rock wall and the side of Iraq and we recreate that. The problem is that's not where they live. That is, but it's not. 
They spend most of their time in holes and under rocks and in crevices in entire like channels that they can walk through that we can't even see on the surface. Mm -hmm. And that's where they live. And then they only use that part that we see for maybe 20 minutes in the morning and at dusk. Or if they need to bask, if they ate, they'll like stick a tail or a foot out from under a rock to get some UV. Like they're not using yeah. that, but that's how we design their habitat. And I want to create something that does both, that allows us to have that beautiful scape that we see that we like, but also allows them to utilize the majority of their habitat and for us to be able to control the majority of that habitat and the, and the, and the requirements inside there. Because that's another thing, like you look at their humid hide, you can control whether it's wet or not wet. That's it. Like, that's about it. Yeah. I mean, unless you're really like wrapping the thing in heat cable with its own thermostat and stuff, you really can't do much to any kind of heat, humid hide other than just make sure it's wet. You know, so like I want to I want to see yeah. I want to see us look at it different. I want to I want to jump on the in the eyes of a gecko and his world and where he walks and how he uses his space around him and create a habitat like that. And I think the hobby, when it started, we had to look at what we had. We had fish tanks, so we used fish tanks. We had other tanks, we used those. But now with the knowledge we have and the research and the technology, I know five guys with CNC machines in their garage making their own cages. Yeah, like, exactly. We're way past glass tanks. The first glass tanks, do you know the first glass tanks ever made were made from the window of a pizza place? Really? <laughs> yeah, in Milwaukee. There you go. That's one way to do yeah. it. <laughs> so like, like that's where they started. And then that's what we went with. We just even look at like the exoterra type cages or, you know, any, any, even the PVC, it's all still a box with a door. The door is just on the front or this way or on top. It's all the same box with the same door. Yeah. Nobody's changed anything. But like if we erased our knowledge of the hobby and it didn't exist and I just went, Hey Dylan, I found this weird little toad in my yard. I, I he looks cool. I think it'd be cool to keep him inside and learn about him. I don't know what he's, I, I, we had to think about how he lived and how he set up. Would we, would we take a glass box and throw a heat light with some tile on it? No, no, no way. We would look at like, we would watch them. We would look at what they do. Like when you were a kid and you caught a toad, yeah. you ripped up grass and leaves and you dug up dirt from there and you got a chunk of wood you found and you made him a little habitat burst up based on the stuff around it. Yeah. You know, you were at least closer. Now we're like, he comes from Africa. And this resin piece that looks like a rock comes from China. <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then this tile looks good. But you know what I mean? Like we're not, we don't do that anymore. And I really want to get back to that. Like if I was a gecko and I, I'm climbing out of my hole and I see the world around me, what does it look like from this high off the ground? Not from the sky or from a camera. Yeah. We do get stuck with these like just conventions and, you know, even like the hot hide, cold hide, those you know things like that, where it's like, that's just, we need to move beyond that. It's time to, you know, we could do so much more. And I think you're right. It's a lot of it is actually just erasing what we know and then using yeah. the technology that we have. Like we couldn't, we could, we, we could using heat mats and different types of technology. I could, I could make the dirt in the cage change temperature throughout the day, ramp up the dirt, the lighting, the humidity. You could do all of that. We have all the technology to do that now. Nobody's just using it because it's expensive and it's hard to do. And that's where it's not, it's not expensive and it's not hard to do. It's just, it seems that way. And that's where, that's what, those are the things we focus on. That's where I want to go. Like that's what some of the next stuff coming out is. Well, why don't we, we why don't we uh, we'll kind of wrap up with, I don't know how many, if you want to talk about this at, at all, but as far as, you know, future products and, and things like, you know, not in five years, something that's a little bit closer. Do you have any products in mind that you're getting ready to launch or are those still uh, under wraps? Yeah, oh yeah. There's a big one coming. Um, and it's the next big one. Uh, and it's going to come out in a lot of stages, but we're, uh, and I've told some people we're working on a lot of smart tech and things like that. So all Wi-Fi controls, that stuff exists. Like sensor push exists and has some sensors. Um, you can buy all that stuff for home security. I mean, everybody has a camera that they bought or something like that. The problem that the thing that kind of sucks is you have to get this ring camera with this different thing, but then that company doesn't have a temperature humidity sensor. So you have to get that from this other company and you have a page on your phone of the different apps you need. This brings all of that under one. Um, and then, so the first launch of it is going to be just a lot of cool Wi-Fi sensors on off switches, things you can set timers for. Um, it's all standard stuff, but it's going to bring it all under one umbrella while we continue to add unique things to it, dimming switches and things like that. Um, the next step is going to be getting that app to uh, 
basically what'll happen is you'll you'll open it up and you'll put you'll you'll say add new enclosure instead of add new products and then you'll add an enclosure you'll say what's in it you know what type of animals in it the size of the enclosure things like that and then it will tell you um like you'll be able to buy a kit that would be like here's your sensor here's your plugs here's your outlets here's all the stuff you need and then inside that habitat you say okay heat is coming from plug one and the sensor for heat is sensor one mm-hmm. and they'll sync up and they'll regulate each other and then you'll do humidity and, you'll do, and then eventually that whole thing will run itself and then underneath it it'll be able to show you a graph of where that animal comes from and the daily temperature humidity ranges for their native habitat so you can follow it a little better if you want you can tweak yourself to follow it um and then the third generation is going to be i'm going to add a button underneath it and it's going to say sync so you can sync your habitat to the native habitat of where they're from in real time that is super cool that yeah, is so, and i'm working so on that. i'm working on barometric pressure too so that we could even i can my background's in HVAC for buildings. I can change the pressure in a building. I can change the pressure in a little box. Like, <laughs> yeah. so we, I could make it where, like just with my background, I can make it where I can, basically creating a, a habitat for people is what I went to school and spent most of my life doing. And now I'm doing it for little boxes, which is way easier. Um, <laughs> but I'm bringing a lot of that same technology and stuff and how I did that to this. Mm. So being able to, I mean, we could, if we do bear, I told Ari Flagel, who does a Bolin's pythons. I yeah. said, look, when I get this done and I set you up, your Bolin's are going to live in a cage. That's exactly, exactly the habitat they came from based on everything I can control. And if they still don't breed, that's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like you can't blame them anymore. It's something you're but doing. Like, but really that really what that would do for species like that is that takes away Okay, it's not it's not a, a seasonal thing. It's not a it's not a humidity or a temperature thing. If we really can recreate down to rainfall and very much pressure their habitat, then it's something else. Mm-hmm. Okay, well that crosses that off. That's a huge piece to cross off. Now let's sec- now the next obvious thing for me, and I've told them this already, is food. Now look at their food. Like do the prey items. I actually asked Ari, I said, does the do the prey items, they have a season. And they get gravid or they get pregnant. And when they get pregnant, they have hormonal changes and they still get eaten while they're pregnant and breeding and their hormones are different. Would those hormonal changes cause us a different hormonal change or a spike in, would the snakes sense that? And could that cause a hormonal change in them? Like, hey, my food's about ready to have babies, which would be food for my babies. Good time to, have, to start working on making babies. Like you could start to look into things like that. Or is it you know, is it some kind of component in the dirt or some micronutrient that spikes that or, you know, it's just, you can start looking outside of temperature, lighting, humidity, mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. You that's, know, a, so. that's a really, I, I love that idea. And what, what would you do to get the input for the, the climate data? How would you go about collecting that? Nice thing is Google pretty much has it for everything already. Yeah, yeah. A lot of it's just pulling them from sources like that, that already have it. Like and weather spark having, and whatnot. Yeah. And you just be able to punch, basically be able to punch it like you would for Google or anywhere else, punch in this place and see their weather or weather.com. All of those type of sources that are places that have that data for all over the world, you just link into their databases. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, I am definitely looking forward to seeing that develop and that I, I would love to be a customer for that product once it comes out. And, and <laughs> sure. as you said, we blew past the one hour mark in this podcast. We're coming <laughs> up to almost three. So I think we'll, we'll start to wrap it up. And as those new products come back, come out, we definitely have you back on. And, and I, I would love to see the, the blood tests as those become more available. And I also would love to see as, as you discover new led diodes that come in that fill that gap. And I think there's a lot of good things to come and a lot of interesting innovation that uh, that you have is there anything that we didn't say that you wanted to to finish up on not really i mean we really did a lot i really i i really do want to say like i i thank you to you for having me on here but also like everyone in the community leaving zilla and like stepping out on our own was scary and the amount of support we've gotten and how many people are fired up and seeing what we're seeing and like just the amount of people that want to see, they want better, but they just don't know where to, to what, how to do it. And that are behind us has just been incredible. And, and hearing people repeat, like, man, I've been talking, I've been talking, I think last time we talked years ago, we talked about UV. I've been talking about UV to people since for a decade mm-hmm. and having that stuff finally sink in the UVA, the importance, looking at these animals differently, 
starting to understand that there, it's not just a thing you stick in a box. Like it's been so rewarding and so fulfilling instead of just, I think in the hobby, people get burnt out and beat down by the, the same crap every day. And uh, yeah, I got to that point. Like I got to that point to a little bit. I still, but I never was not me and excited and, you know, but it's still, there's a little bit of a, uh, and now, I mean, I'm, I have more energy and excitement than I know what to do with. And, and I love it. And I'm excited to see where this goes and I'm excited to see everybody running with us and, you know, keep, give us time. We're little and we're going to definitely, I'm going to screw something up and have to fix it. But um, everything we do, we're doing for the animals and we're doing to better the hobby and, it's that's what it's about. It's all about donating and giving back and, and and creating a better life for the animals. If I make a million dollars, that's awesome. If I break even, I still am fine. Yeah. So, well, I think I can speak for most people say we're very excited and it does feel like it's like a hobbyist starting a brand. That's kind of what it feels like. I'm sure that's why you're getting a lot of the support. People probably feel like it's one of us doing that. And, and yeah, so that's, yeah. So that's fantastic. I'm very excited to see how it develops over time. And can you let everybody know where they can find VivTech and yourself online? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you can find us at VivTechProducts.com. Um, you can find us on Instagram and on Facebook, VivTech Products. And right now they're only available in the U.S. That's changing. Um, hopefully by 2022, by my goal is that January one, we have Canada opened up. So you guys, it's not as big of a market, but I don't care. Cause I love my Canadian people <laughs> and I got to get it back up to Toronto soon. I got to bug some people, but, um, no, I, 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 that you guys will be getting that. And then we're going to be, we're working on UK distribution and EU as well right now, as well as Australia. So, um, hopefully by the end of the year, next year, every country in the world will have access to these, our products. So. Um, thanks for, and, and, and also like, God, thanks for the patience. Oh my God, we're out of stocks we've run through and we're burning through product faster than I can get it. And I'm trying to sell kids, but nobody wants to buy them. And yeah, like <laughs> trying to get that funds, but yeah, just kidding. I'm not really selling my children. <laughs> I, I, you wouldn't sell your, your, your workers and I don't have to pay them. So why would I sell them? Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> no, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I, it's awesome. And, and, and there's cooler, there's even cooler stuff coming. I wish, like, I wish I could tell you about everything I'm finding. Cause I'm getting excited for some of the samples I have. I bought, I got something I can connect to my phone to see the infrared, uh, infrared layout of my cage. Oh my gosh. So I can physically look at my heat gradient and everything in my cage. That's amazing. Well, we'll definitely yeah. have you back on when some of those things are, are more developed and you can talk about them more because I would love to hear about it. That's, that's very cool. For sure. For did sure. did you just, mention yeah, the website? Did, yeah. VivTechProducts.com. Oh, products. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and you have Instagram as well, right? Yeah, we have Instagram, we have a Facebook, um, and then as well, uh, um, coming up here in the future as well too, uh, very shortly actually, we will have when wholesale launches for all the pet stores, we're also gonna have uh, breeder discounts available. So, um, cause I know as a breeder, it sucks when you're like, I have to buy 27 of these bulbs. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's rough. Um, it's not, a, I can't do a ton, I can't do wholesale to everybody just because then like, there's no reason to have a real price if I just wholesale to everybody. Yeah. Um, and I have to make money so I can do more cool stuff. Uh, but uh, no, uh, uh, every uh, breeder will be able to sign up for an account and get 10% off of bulk purchase bulbs. And then if you're a US ARC member, you get 15% off. So excellent. Everybody that's a US ARC member gets a bigger discount. Awesome. Well, I love the model. I love the conservation focused as well. And I think it, it is what the hobby needs. Thank you very much, Ryan. This was a blast chatting with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I can't wait to come back on. We'll just keep taking up four, three, four, five hours of every day we have. <laughs> Exactly. No, this is awesome. Thank you very much. Oh, absolutely, man. Take care. All right. That is the end of that episode. Ryan, thank you so much for spending all the time with me today and also taking the time to set up your computer and show us the spectrometer. That was fantastic. And I'm definitely very interested to see how these products develop over time. I know you have new products coming in that you're planning on testing. So I'll be looking forward to seeing how that all that testing works out. And we'll be keeping an eye for new product launches in the future. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. As always, I am deeply grateful for everyone that listens to the podcast. So thank you so much for doing that. If you did enjoy it, really the best thing you can do to show your gratitude is just share it on social media, share it on Facebook or Instagram. That really does help a lot. If you're looking for more information on this episode, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. As always, if you'd like to join us on Patreon, head to patreon.com slash animals at home. There we have access to early episodes as well as you have closer access to me. You can send me messages and whatnot. And we do hang out on Zoom, usually about once a month or once every five weeks or so. 
so. And finally, thank you so much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you're looking for anything reptile related, make sure you head to the link in either the YouTube description or the show notes. That is an affiliate link. So if you do make a a small or a purchase, a small commission will come back to me. Of course, that is at no extra cost to you. And that is the end of today's episode. Thank you so much for listening and I will catch you guys next Sunday.